So good morning, everyone, and welcome to India and a beautiful city of Hyderabad. Uh, we are all here today because we are committed to NTB from the world. And it's an honor for me to host this meeting along with the union uh, who has been hosting this big conference, NTB Science. Uh, it was started last year, the TB conference, yes, 50th TB conference. I, along with Mark, who's the international co-chair and the local co-chair, welcome you all to this TB Science 2019 and start the conference. So this TB Science conference is dedicated to development of the new tools towards vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics. It has been a very interesting journey and how this two-day program has shaped up that I think the journey Mark is going to explain that uh, two-day journey in the program which has shaped up so well. So over to you, Mark. Thanks, Manjula. So um, last year's conference in The Hague was the first uh, TB science conference. Looking at the program, uh, I expect that this year will be equally, if not more exciting. The uh, scientific committee has been working hard behind the scenes, and I'd like to thank them for their efforts, as well as the organizing committee and, of course, the funders of the meeting. Over the next two days, you're going to be hearing about the latest developments in, in diagnostics, new vaccines, new therapeutics, and new concepts in transmission. We're going to be hearing exciting new results from, from junior investigators. And I'd also like to encourage you to take the opportunity to interact, to uh, engage with the, the poster presenters, and to interact amongst uh, yourselves, amongst the audience, and talk to each other. Use the opportunity to network. So without further ado, uh, we'd like to open the session, and I'd like to uh, ask the chairs of the first session uh, to, to come forward. And um, so Claudia, Avashi, and, and Anita, and uh, we'll open the meeting for today. Thank you. So with no further delay, I'm inviting Dr. Emmanuel Moreau from FIND. He is Senior Scientific Officer at the intra, In Vitro Diagnostic uh, Technology Devo Development. He is going to speak about the uh, LAM uh, next generation tests. Thank you. I have my timer. So, thanks for the invitation and giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, next generation of LAM test, where to go from here and how do we get there. So, LAM is short for lipoarabinomalan. It's a mycobacterial antigen. It's a 70 kilodelton transmembrane glycolipid, which accounts for 60% of the bacterial cell wall and almost 15% of the dry weight of the mycobacteria, which makes it an attractive biomarker for active TB detection because it's been shown to be present in various body fluids, sputum, urine, blood, and CSF. The issue with, this, uh, with LAM as a biomarker is it can range from a concentration as high as thousands of picogram per ml, but also down to 10 picogram per ml or even lower, which makes it a very challenge for lateral flow technology at the point of care to detect. So what's the state of the art of urine lamb immunoassays? There are two commercials, two commercial assays available or almost available for one of them. Both are point of care uh, lateral flow qualitative test, IVD grade, First one is the earlier determined TB LAM antigen, which, be, which has been around for uh, five to six years. And the other one is the Fujifilm Silvamp TB LAM, which will be available at the end of 2020 and currently undergoing clinical trials. I won't talk extensively about the, I mean, the clinical performance of these assays because it would be covered by others today, including the talk by um, Stephanie later today. 
So um, besides these two commercial IVD assays, we have the mesoscale discovery LAM reference platform. It's an RUO test. It's a lab-based quantitative test developed by FINE together with MSD. And uh, we have used it to characterize LAM antibodies and to explore LAM in urine and blood in the past few years. The assay has now been transferred to PATH and to be used as a centralized hub for LAM uh, research in the years to come. And it will give common ground for uh, multiple uh, LAM developers to really assess their solution with reference reagents and standardize sample that has been, I mean, things that have been missing up to now. So quickly, just to, to map the performance of these different assays on the, I mean, the, the rock curve of sensitivity and specificity, you would see that in uh, none of them, I speak of about the, I mean, the, the point of care test, clearly reach the targets of sensitivity and specificity either for the TPP2 of triage or the TPP1 for diagnosis. I mean, the earlier test is clearly uh, under par in terms of clinical sensitivity, and it only works in HIV-positive patients at a sensitivity around 40%. Fujifilm is capable of reaching the TPP1, but only in HIV patients. While the MSD platform is uh, I mean, in the right area, but it's not a point of care, it's not obviously an IVD assay. Now, I mean, does it mean that the lateral flow tests for urine LAM are capable only of detecting LAM in HIV because LAM is not basically present in other HIV neck population? It's been quite a hot debate in the past few years, but it's been clearly established now that LAM is present in most of the TB patients, regardless of the HIV status. The point is that LAM concentration is higher in HIV-positive patients with low CD4 counts, one can expect concentrations from in a few hundreds to a few thousand picogram per ml. But LAM is at much lower levels in HIV neg patients, one or two orders of magnitude. So we are here in the range of 10 to 100 picogram per ml. Which means that using the ALIA test, which has a cutoff of 500 picogram per ml, and the assay is only capable of detecting LAM in 50% uh, uh, of the HIV-positive patients, I mean HIV-TB co-infected patients, and almost none of the HIV-neg TB patients. While using the Fujifilm test, which has a cutoff of 50 picogram per ml, in that case, the sensitivity reaches 70% or higher in HIV-positive patients and almost 50% in HIV-neg. But you would see that all these patients here have LAM levels that basically escape the detection by the lateral flow test. So it's clear that the current, the current LAM tests are limited in clinical sensitivity because the cutoff for the detection of the antigen is not low enough. So how to get to a better LAM test? And a better LAM test means a test which would be ultra sensitive with a cutoff lower than 10 picogram per ml. I mean, this, just keep in mind that this is the kind of sensitivity that one would reach with lab-based assays, uh, like I mean, the classical platforms such as an architect or a centaur. But it's very, very challenging for lateral flow to reach that level of sensitivity. So there are multiple avenues. One of them, of course, is the, the use of improved reagents. And we'll see to that soon. The other one is a sample prep. As of now, the two commercial assays do not use sample prep, so it's a, it's a step that can really dramatically increase the sensitivity of a given assay. And finally, incorporating all of that in an innovative assay design. But let's start first with the antibodies, because this is basically the alpha and omega of I mean, immunoassay development. Improved antibodies bring better clinical sensitivity, which means that I mean, the, the, the higher affinity they have, the, better, the best limit of detection they get, really translate into uh, improvement into the detection of LAM and uh, in clinical population. You can see on that graph here, it was a work that was done by Siegel and colleagues uh, last year, uh, two years ago, uh, which is basically mapping the performance of the different antibodies that were available at the time and clearly showing that 
the ones with the better sensitivity are the ones, if I can get my mouse, yeah, are the ones with the lower LOD. So the lower cutoff, the better sensitivity. And the current best antibody pairs is the Otsuka S420 for a capture and the Rutgers A194 for detection. However, if you really take a close look, I can, you can't. Yeah, that was done, not done on purpose for suspense, but. Okay, I can do it without, this, without the pick. No, now it's back. That's fine. Thank you. So look, for example, antibody fine 28 has a lower LOD as compared to S420. So it should be better, right? But in the end, in the final design of the assay, it's, it, has a, it has a poor specificity and not so good sensitivity. And this is because they target different epitopes at the surface of the LAM antigen. So it's not only a question of having an, an antibody which can bind very efficiently to the target. It's also about the specificity of this antibody. And the issue here is that in all of these data have been generating using purified LAM from culture. So it's a very clean antigen. But LAM in urine, LAM in blood, or wherever, is, doesn't have the same structure. And this, the structure of LAM, of endogenous LAM, as of now, is vastly unknown. So we are developing new tools, but we don't understand quite the antigen, how it is presented in nature. So it is, it is capable of being basically bound by the antibodies we develop. So the road to improve antibody really goes through a better understanding of the endogenous LAM in the patient's samples. So new development of LAM antibodies are being currently pursued by multiple groups. So homologic, Rutgers, Biopromic, uh, and uh, an array of uh, antibody developers by, I mean, led by FIND. The common point of them is to use for most of the activities synthetic glycans that cover the different epitopes at the surface of LAM, which are uh, generated by the University of Alberta and Todd Lauer's group to really try to develop antibodies that are better than the ones we have now or to be used in complements. Because if we want to reach LAM in each and every patient, whatever the variety of structure uh, LAM is presenting, we may end up by using multiple antibodies for capture and multiple antibodies for detection. So sample prep. Sample prep is twofold and can have two different roles. One is to release and make the antigen available in the sample for, anti uh, for antibody binding. And this is really to homogenize LAM in the sample and to make it prone to uh, detection by the lateral flow assay in line. As I said, LAM can be, I mean, pure LAM, free LAM in a sample does not exist. It is complex uh, either I mean, uh, in, in micelles or in, uh, in, in can be bound in exosome, can be also bound by I mean, uh, sugar binding proteins that basically hide the different epitopes that are the target of the, the antibodies. So the role, the first role of sample prep is to release and make the, I mean, the LAM bioavailable. The second role is to uh, enrich or concentrate LAM in the sample. Let's take, for example, a patient with a urine LAM level of 10 picogram per ml. It does not, it is not detected as of now by the current assays. However, if you are capable of applying a concentration method that would basically concentrate it like five times or even more, you will turn a 10 picogram per ml sample into a 50 picogram per ml sample. And in that case, this can be detected, for example, by the Fuji LAM test. So really, the concentration of LAM uh, is boosting the LAM content to improve the clinical sensitivity in the end. So here again, multiple groups are working on sample prep, and um, either for LAM liberation, which means there has been publish, publication by the CSU team, uh, by either I mean, freeing LAM uh, through uh, enzyme digestion or by uh, chemical treatment but also for LAM enrichment, Ceres Nanoscience and Celes Discovery are currently developing 
um, in sample prep solutions that are both based on magnetic particles. Uh, Ceres is using nanotraps, which are enriching non specifically for LAM and basically releasing the antigen in a smaller volume for uh, inline testing by uh, any, a classical LFA. And uh, this pre enrichment step re showed good results with the earlier test and with an, an increased assay sensitivity. Salus is having the same kind of approach, but this time using bees coated with the specific antibodies for LAM that are then to capture LAM in a, in a large volume and then being processed on their proprietary LFA. And the clinical testing is to start at the end of this year. If you want to know more about the Salus technology, there is a poster by Adrien Shapiro, which is, is going to present the latest clinical data on that. I can mention as well another poster by uh, Global Good, which deals with another uh, sample prep for uh, uh, testing in line with their own developed LFA. So finally, getting that into an innovative LFA design. Can't really talk a lot about that as of now because the other components, I mean, the sample prep and uh, improved antibodies are not available yet. So it's difficult to, to see how it's gonna be blended and put together in uh, innovative design. What we can mention, however, is that signal amplification should play a great role into getting to a better assay. For example, it's been quite instrumental for, uh, in the design of the Fujifilm test. There are, I mean, Fujifilm has developed severe amplification technology which basically adds on top of the gold particle layer that is um, in accumulating on the lateral flow membrane, putting on top of that a thick layer of silver particles. And these silver particles make a bulky, visib mean visually, visually identified uh, line onto the test, which basically enhance the, um, the, the detection of, the, of, of LAM. Another, another avenue is to use I mean, the fluorescence, like for example, European beads. And these beads can, uh, can be then either visualized directly or uh, through a reader. This will help for sensitivity, but also help for sensitivity by I mean, decreasing the background uh, noise. Now we have talked a lot about LAM in urine, but we can also have a look, quick look at LAM in other, in other sample types, as for example, LAM in blood. And uh, it's, been, it's been shown that LAM is present in blood as in, in uh, amounts comparable to as in urine. Of course, the blood test is less straightforward in terms of sample prep, but now that we are talking about sample prep for urine, why not for blood? And in that case, I mean, we may need other antibodies as the one for urine, and of course, as of now, the first data show I mean, kind of very low sensitivity. But I would not be surprised if in the next two or three years we see the development of new blood tests for LAM. Because in some settings, getting urine, which is a, believed as an, urine, uh, as an easy sample, is not that easy. And I mean, the blood-based tests are well, quite well known. And this is exactly the kind of I mean, easy-to-use test that would be developed at the point of care. Finally, LAM in sputum. So the TPPs for non-sputum-based tests have been developed just to avoid having to deal with LAM. So not talking about having to deal with sputum, sorry. Not talking about developing a lateral flow point of care test for LAM, but just to think that, for example, the uh, Otsuka Pharma company has developed an ELISA to detect and quantify LAM in sputum and they have been able to correlate in the LAM content of the sputum sample with the fitness of the bacteria after drug treatment, which opened new avenues for potential use of LAM as a treatment monitoring tool, not at the point of care, but probably in the central lab. But the future of LAM test as of now is clearly in urine testing. To get there, we need an ultra sensitivity detection to diagnose TB or triage patients according to the LAM presence in urine. The assay performance should allow to detect TB in all patients regardless of the HIV status and also to include extra pulmonary TB. This will require multiple improvements and of methods and reagents, sample prep, improved antibodies, innovative assay design. 
And this is why we need a strong body of knowledge about endogenous LAM. I'm saying that again, but if we want to develop proper tools for the high sensitivity test, we need to know better the antigen we are targeting in the clinical sample. And last but not least, the ultimate challenge is really to integrate all of these new tools into an affordable, easy to use, and robust test that to be used at the point of care. But given the, the, the speed at which the LAM field is evolving, I would not be surprised to have like very, very interesting clinical data on all these different new technological approaches to present next year at TB Science 2020. Thanks for your attention. In case there are one or two questions, maybe we could take that. Hi, Hi, this is Dr. Rajni Rani from National Institute of Immunology. Uh, I have a naive question. Can LAMP be used for latent TB as well? Oh, that's a... Could be, but the problem, as we see, that I mean, LAM even in, in active TB is very low in terms of I mean, the, the amount that can be detected. So I would expect in latent TB the LAM to be even lower, which is really a challenge at the point of care. Now, if we get to develop much more sensitive tools, it may be really worth it to explore LAM as a marker for latent TB, but this would really yield some technological leap to make sure that we are capable of detecting levels that are even lower than the 10 picogram per ml that we're talking about. But that's really, I mean, that needs to be explored once we get the tools. So there are mics around. Uh, if there are any further questions, anybody else? Could kindly stand in their place so the speaker can actually see them. Hi. Um, uh, hello. Uh, great talk. Thank you very much. Really helpful and, and informative. Uh, it's a potentially a stupid question, but given that LAM is a, is a component of mycobacterial cell walls, what about the differentiation between NTMs and MTB, particularly as you become more sensitive? Yeah, exactly. This has been a very important question because this, is, this has been around for quite some time. So uh, this is why the, the antibody has been, the, the antibody that has made a huge difference in the recent year is this S420 antibody from Otsuka because it really binds to the MTX uh, epitope, I mean the MTX structure which is present only at the surface of MTB LAM as compared to others. And this is why the development of the new antibodies really need to keep focus on, I mean, targeting this kind of epitopes that are I mean, exquisitely specific to the MTB lab and not the others. So that's exactly the way to go forward, and this is why we need this new generation of LAM antibodies with the knowledge that we have already acquired on the differentiation between the different um, in the LAM from different mycobacteria species. I guess we'll move on Hi. to the next speaker. Okay, anything else? Anybody? I was just about to ask, your Ask Question feature on the app, first of all, is not working. Uh, secondly, um, so I'm, I'm sure somebody can take care of that. Okay. Okay. They're working on it, I told them already. Okay. Um, about the LAM, when you mentioned that um, the, it's only good, really, for HIV positives with high CD4, low CD4 count. So I'm, I'm a little confused now. Why negatives uh, with a lot of TB bacilli in them, you know, florid TB. So if it's a matter of quantity, then they also should be positive. So could you explain why not? Yeah, of course. As I said, it's really a question of, I mean, it's a, it's a sensitivity game. So as we say, LAM is present in almost all TB patients, regardless they are HIV positive or not. It's just that the current tools that we have in terms of I mean, the commercial assays are, I mean, have a cutoff which is I mean, for Fujilam as low as 50 picogram per ml, which is good enough to capture 
and to detect LAM in HIV positive patients. But in HIV negative patients, LAM is there but at lower levels. This is why we need a second generation of tests to get there. Uh, so we thank Dr. Maru. Um, and uh, the rest of the questions, I'm sure the Ask the app will be rectified soon and can actually be taken at the end. So. Uh, be talking on quantification of circulating MTB antigens for a rapid TB detection. Dr. Hugh's uh, research interests are actually uh, aimed at current unmet clinical needs for early disease detection, better predictors of disease progression, and real-time monitoring of therapy response to improve patient outcomes. Dr. Hugh has assembled a diverse research team with backgrounds in biochemistry, immunology, mass spectrometry, epigenetics, nanofabrication, and biomedical engineering to address challenges of biomarker discovery. His research group has established and refined a biomarker detection platform to quantitate the peptidome of circulating mycobacterial antigen and validate its capacity to diagnose a species of mycobacteria and its response to therapeutic intervention. To well, you, please. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the invitation from chairs. And uh, um, so it's very exciting for us to report the, our research progression. Uh, so at first, the, I'd like to disclose the, the um, our funding resource and also commercialization activities. And uh, the NanoPin tag located in the Phoenix, Arizona, is uh, uh, working on the technology related with these presentations. Um, so I actually didn't expect to present to such big group audience, and, uh, but right before the, the presentation, I delete uh, two slides. One is for the TB fact, the, the basic fact, and I think everybody understand uh, what problem we're facing now. Uh, facing now, and the second one is the the the, uh, the talking about the other technologies, and uh, I'm pretty sure there's definitely some representative come from the Ox uh, Oxford or Saipe, and so we don't want to comment too much. So uh, so here's the slide I actually copied from the Dr. Tony Fauci's slide presented on the impact meeting several years ago. And he lists the three uh, highest priorities for tuberculosis diagnosis. And the first one is, can we have the very rapid uh, method, which is independent of bacterial isolations? Uh, I think uh, the, um, the, the previous speaker already lists our effort. Uh, and the second one is, uh, can we have uh, the non-sputum-based uh, non test? Uh, means we can test uh, the, uh, the blood, serum, plasma, or urine, and then we can cover the, the uh, many other forms of uh, tuberculosis. And the third one, can we do the accurate quantification and we can provide the, uh, the information, the rapid information in, the, in detecting the treatment response. Um, so we actually, then we generated the idea of trying to cover the, uh, all of this need. And the, it's a, at first, it's pretty straightforward because we're trying to identify the marker because if we want to develop the new technology, if the marker doesn't work, uh, where the marker is not very specific to the disease, and uh, the, the effort will be wasted. And so we, folk, we like to, folk, uh, we, we believe the antigen uh, secreted from the mycobacterials or the infected macrophage uh, cell, definitely they have the chance to flow into the blood. And um, uh, if uh, our technology is uh, sensitive enough, because we're working on the nanotechnology, and uh, uh, we should be able to detect them. Uh, but uh, through years of effort, and uh, we realize it's uh, quite difficult, because the antigen uh, is uh, so is for them, and the uh, antigen is uh, uh, generally in the very low concentrations in the blood, and because they 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 usually encapsulate by the the host protein. Uh, or the, their antibody. Um, so, and the second, the second challenging is that even you capture the, 
It's back to that lady's questions. And uh, even you capture the antigen, and uh, for example, like the, the antigen we target is CIPT and ESA6, and uh, they are not only belong to mycobacterial tuberculosis and uh, micro, uh, the microcansasi and the uh, abscesses, they also secrete a CIP10. And uh, so even you capture the, lungs, uh, the long lens of a protein using the very sensitive immunoassay, uh, you cannot tell, the, uh, the, the clinician cannot tell this patient was infected by, uh, the, by the TB or other NTM. So um, to better address this problem, and uh, we move forward to uh, look at their peptide fragment. And uh, so uh, surprisingly, we identified uh, the, uh, the, some peptide specific, uh, very highly specific to uh, MTB. And um, so, and which we believe we, if, we, if we can uh, isolate them from the blood, and uh, we're able to offer the very direct uh, diagnostic result and also differentiate MTB from other NTM. So the paper was published uh, the, in 2017. So if you're interested, you can uh, take a look how we work it out or how, how we select the biomarker, the peptide biomarkers. So once we uh, find out the, the, uh, the useful biomarker and we start designing the, uh, the, the method, and uh, so at the first, there here is our sample preparation protocols, and at the first, uh, we do the very quick uh, sample digestion and using the microwave, and uh, it's generally just used 20 minutes. Uh, then the, we got the, the, the target peptide uh, in the digested solution. Then we mixed uh, the solution with the, uh, the nanoparticles, which is uh, the nanoporous silicon uh, disc. So uh, then we conjugate the uh, customized peptide antibody on the disc. So why we want to use the nanoporous structure? Because the, such a structure can have the enlarged surface area, like a sponge. So they can efficiently uh, enrich the, the target peptide. And then we used uh, the, uh, the multi-tough mass bag to profile it at a first, in the first phase. And uh, because multi is uh, uh, the very high throughput method and the low end and the bench top, uh, the, uh, uh, the mass bag. And also, uh, more importantly, at the most, uh, the hospital um, the, in developed country and the, some of the developing country already equipped with multi-tough. And um, so uh, once we spike the nanoparticles on the uh, multi plate, and the, the, this nanoporous structure performed the second function, and which is called energy transfer. So the nanopore preserve the energy from the laser, and uh, then pass those energy to the target peptide, and the tar target peptide receive the energy, and they can fly and to be detected by to be better detected by. The, uh, the mass spec detector. So here is a showing the difference uh, with or without using the, the nanoparticles for uh, two peptide profilings. Uh, one is from the CIP10, the other one from the uh, ESA6. Um, so this particles fabrication is, um, um, the ver is pretty standard, and we rely on the very mature technology from Silicon Lab. So which means the uh, if we pass the recipe to Intel or Samsung, and they can also make the, the nan, uh, silicon nano disk, and uh, in another word, uh, they can be easy, easily scaled up uh, for the manufacturing. So um, the next, and we involved uh, isotope labeled peptide as the internal standard, and set up the absolute quantification method. Uh, so the, here is, uh, uh, spectrum from the uh, the TB patients and also the controls, and as shown in the blue uh, and as shown in the the right curve, that's uh, the signal from patients. Um, so once we have everything and we start the preclinical validation, it's a pretty early pilot study, and uh, we collaborate with uh, uh, the uh, the NIH clinical centers. So they contribute us seven, uh, some 76 pulmonary TB and 19 X extra pulmonary TB. So based on our hypothesis, and uh, we, should, we, sh uh, we should see the very similar sensitivity in, uh, in this two subgroup. Um, so, 
and Halsey, the 96 Halsey, and uh, showing the, the very decent uh, specificity. And uh, well, uh, at first we submitted this paper to uh, another nature journals, and the editor is very interesting and led us to test the pneumonia patients. And so we got uh, two patients showing the very weak signal, and based on the, of, uh, uh, the, uh, the definition at that time, and we have to list them as a false positive. But one patient actually, uh, when we check their medical record, and the one patient, uh, the, their, uh, the skin test is showing the three centimeter spot. And also, we test 24 NTM, including the mycocansasi, intracellular and the uh, mic and um, uh, and several others, and um, so the 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 pretty good specificity showing the power of use of peptide as as biomarker. Um, then we uh, try to identify if these markers can also differentiate active TB from a latent, and um, uh, so we got 34, uh, thir uh, 31 uh, latent infections samples and. Uh, four of them showing the weak signal, and again, we have to list them as the false positive based on the of a definition. And um, uh, we got more false positive in the HIV and the latent, co uh, latent TB co-infection, uh, and also we also tested the diabetes and the latent TB co-infections. So after this, we start uh, um, a larger scale of validations. We collaborate with the hospital in China, and uh, so they collect uh, the um, almost 1,000 patient samples, but, based, but we collaborate with U.S. doctors and set up the very strict uh, criteria. So eventually there's uh, 300 samples we can use, and including the 95 uh, culture positive and the 102 culture negative, and also 20, uh, 96 uh, samples can serve as control. And also the, in the culture positive and negative, we include, uh, they also include the different number of a pulmonary and the extra pulmonary TB. Um, so at first, we like to see if, uh, we like to revalidate if this method can uh, perform, can provide the similar sensitivity in the pulmonary and the extra pulmonary TB. So uh, the sensitivity for pulmonary is 88% uh, and the extra pulmonary is 90%. Um, then we uh, target on the, the, the primary problem for developing country, for the coordination working in the developing countries and the, how, this, how this assay perform in uh, diagnosing the culture negative. So uh, we reached the 85% uh, sensitivity worth 92% uh, in the culture positive. Uh, so this paper was also published uh, last year. Um, and uh, some unpublished data uh, also showing this uh, marker uh, could be sensitive in detecting the uh, early detecting the treatment response. Um, so, but we haven't finished this because the, the information collection for this study is kind of off. Uh, so we're looking for the, the other collaborators who can help us to complete this. Um, so, but you can tell from this, and the most patients are just showing the dramatically uh, decline uh, within the one or two weeks in the antigens, and uh, we also have uh, the very massive spectrum for the drug resistant patients. I didn't, uh, we, we don't have to show here. And the next target is uh, the HIV and the TB co infected patients, and uh, so uh, here is uh, the problem for this double trouble uh, problem in the field, and uh, so we also collaborate with the Houston. Uh, Houston doctors, and uh, so they contribute us that the sample is uh, fairly old. <laughs> so they, they conducted the program in the 2000, uh, 1995 to uh, 2004, so which means that some of the sample has been staying in the freezer for 20 years. Um, so, and surprisingly, uh, the, the, uh, the HIV and TB, the, the antigen level in the blood uh, from the patients with HIV and TB co-infection co uh, is higher than the higher than the, the HIV negative but TB positive patients. Uh, so the the next target is a triple stride, and uh, we uh, the uh, is sponsored by an AID uh, R1 grants, and uh, we collaborate with the, the several clinician scientists, uh, including the uh, Dr. 
the Charlie Mitchell from the University of uh, Miami and uh, Sil Dr. Sylvia Lockhorse from the uh, University of Washington and uh, Dr. Uh, Sonia King from the, the, the Harvard Medical School and uh, uh, the, the Sylvia and the Sonia, they're sitting here. So I really appreciated their effort because without them, uh, so this, uh, the, uh, the, the, all the medical uh, record for us is just like uh, the, a book writing in the Latin language. And uh, so uh, this is uh, the first, uh, uh, this first time for us to conduct uh, the such uh, large, the blended, ta uh, blended test. And um, uh, so you can, you can see we have uh, the over 600 pa uh, patient samples to, to use. And uh, uh, we used uh, the 2015 NIH criteria to define the, uh, the, the group, uh, including the confirmed TB Unconfirmed TB and the unlikely TB. Um, so, uh, so the table here is uh, showing the baseline uh, demographic and uh, for those patients. And so uh, the Soyan and the Sylvia make a lot of uh, effort in summarizing the those information uh, we saw with the postdocs. And uh, eventually we have uh, the uh, the for pulmonary TB and we have a uh, six confirmed. And uh, uh, for uh, extra pulmonary TB, we have two, and also 108 uh, unconfirmed, and um, uh, also the uh, 402 unlikely TB. Uh, so here is uh, the performance uh, the, for this IC, and uh, as you can tell, uh, the, for the confirmed TB, uh, we reached uh, 100%, and for unconfirmed TB, and uh, we reached uh, 81%. Uh, for the specificity uh, is, is around the, uh, 90, 94%. Um, so, and the most important thing for us is uh, uh, not only that we're showing the, um, the better performance for this IC compared to the other traditional uh, diagnostic method, and we don't have uh, the gene expert at that time yet, and, um, um, but also, if you look at the, the panel on the right side, okay, and uh, so you can tell at the, the diagnostic point that's zero, and uh, the sample was collected uh, when the when the patient is around three months old, and um, uh, then every two, twelve weeks they collect a sample, and for some for uh, three of them, and we can detect the TB antigen in their blood and uh, 60 weeks earlier than the, um, the, the gold standard confirmation. So uh, it's showing the potential of early detection in those infant patients. Um, so, and then uh, we report this result to the NIH Clinical Center and the scientific director, Dr. Steve Holland, also like us to try the, uh, the similar idea for NTM. So, um, but of course, we don't have the capability to cover the um, 190 NTM uh, the spaces, but we target on the, uh, the seven major strings. We identified the peptide derived from another antigens, antigen 85 Antigen 85B, uh, they actually shared by this seven major string, but they uh, they, they also have the teeny tiny difference in the amino acid. We can precisely pers uh, profile them using the mass spec. So using the similar per the sample processing uh, protocol, and uh, you can differentiate these several major uh, several major the mycobacterial species. And we're continuing working on this. And uh, here is the the, fo the first blunted test uh, the, of uh, uh, of the sample contributed from an NIH Clinical Center. And um, uh, so you can tell uh, on the, the right side, that's our result. And uh, the, middle, the middle column is uh, the result uh, from, from the, the NIH Clinicians. Um, so to summary this, and uh, our technology, we don't need a solid culture. And uh, uh, it's a, a turnaround time. And uh, uh, we... Uh, for the mass spec, and uh, if you run the single samples, you may need uh, four hours. And uh, but uh, for if you want to run the like a, uh, 200 samples, uh, you may need six to seven hours. Uh, so because there's a high throughput test, 
and um, we don't have to use a sputum anymore, and uh, uh, we can use uh, serum or plasma or, e or the, the frozen serum, uh, frozen blood. And um, uh, we can also identify the different species in the microbacterial. Uh, for not right now, it's only for the several major strains. Um, so do the quantification for monitoring, the treatment the monitoring, and also um, the, the and blood antigen test, they don't have to carry this, uh, the, the HIV status and pediatrics or extra pulmonary uh, infection. So, and after this, we also developed the, another, the, the, we extend the, expand the, the, the platforms and also including the HIV, uh, HIV, HIV species uh, specific peptide biomarkers. So right now we can uh, co-profile the P24 antigen peptide and the CIP10 antigen peptide in the same spectrum and do the quantification. Um, so here is the, the performance for those. The advantage of using the P20, P24 peptide is we can really uh, the quantify the uh, antigen label similar uh, protocols uh, for Ebola test. And uh, so the, right now, the most recent result in that we can reach the four states after the, the uh, monkey was uh, infect infected. And uh, by using the three peptide, and we can simultaneously identify the Ebola infection and also differentiate the five major uh, strains of Ebola. Uh, and also for commercializations, uh, this is uh, the, the roadmap for this technology starting from 2013, and we generated uh, the such idea and keep working on the IC optimization and uh, also conducted uh, several clinical validations. And uh, we also established uh, the, uh, the, the startup company, and he received uh, the, some seed fund. And uh, yesterday, we just signed a research agreement with uh, Sermon Fishers, and uh, there's um, a big wonder in the mass spec field. Uh, I, before the question and answer section, I believe that some uh, audience will ask us that if you use mass spec, and when you're going to apply this uh, technology to the field. And uh, there's uh, several offers we're making. And uh, the first one, of course, there's a portable mass spec. And uh, we're applying the, the peptide using the portable mass spec. That's another uh, the NIH grant um, the, we collaborate with uh, Purdue University. And uh, also the recent very promising one is uh, we also use nanopore technologies to profile those peptide, and uh, um, the, we also collaborate with uh, uh, Johns Hopkins team to apply the, another grant, okay? Um, so here is uh, our team. I really appreciate everyone's effort uh, and uh, all the collaborators like uh, Sylvia and Soya and Charlie. Without them, and uh, we, we cannot the gut, we cannot understand very much the, uh, how urgent need the, the TB diagnostic is. And also our alumni uh, in the, yeah, ever work in, the, in our lab in the past. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Tony. Unfortunately, we are a bit behind, so I think okay. we have to uh, cut questions short, but I'm sure Tony will be around in the coffee break to, to answer any uh, specific questions. And I just want to comment, the app, unfortunately, uh, is a bit slow. I think it's actually the internet that's slow because it's slow on the front end and on my back end, meaning that uh, it's no use for questions directly after the talk because I see it too late. And if you use it, wait a few seconds if you click on the ask uh, until the screen appears where you can enter the question. But I would propose that we use it um, for the panel later, so please, uh, if you look at the panel topic for later, uh, think about questions that you might have. It should all relate to the question, to the talks we have uh, given now. Um, so um, please uh, enter questions for the panel, but for the questions at the end of the individual talks, we'll ask you to, to stand up. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Sharon Wong, who is uh, Associate Director of, in, of the Infectious Disease Program at the Broad Institute uh, in Cambridge. And Sharon will talk about a very exciting uh, topic, uh, CRISPR-based uh, diagnostics, which is transforming many uh, other diagnostic fields, and uh, she is looking to apply it for TB. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'd just like to thank the organizers of this meeting for the kind invitation to 
share with you some of the work that we've been doing to apply CRISPR technology to develop a TB diagnostic. And so first I'd like to provide a little bit of context about where we envision our diagnostics to fit within the TB uh, diagnostic landscape. And so this figure here was summarized by in Fine's 2015 to 2020 strategy for TB report, where they prioritize the tools that are needed across the, health, the various levels of the healthcare systems um, for TB. And so you can see that uh, the tools that are needed range anywhere from case detection all the way down to treatment monitoring. And so we envision um, being able to address specifically the need for a case detection test that can be deployed at the most resource limited uh, levels of the healthcare system. And so in the parlance of TPPs, we think that we can translate our CRISPR technologies into a rapid biomarker based, non sputum based test for detecting TB with an eye particularly towards pediatric and HIV co-infected patients for whom sputum production is particularly challenging. And so I wanted to give a little bit of background about where our technologies um, come from. And so CRISPR CRISPR-based technologies really derive their inspiration from systems found in nature, and particularly CRISPR-Cas systems. And so for those who may not be completely familiar with the CRISPR-Cas systems, these systems are a bacterial's um, adaptive immune, immune system, which they've evolved over many uh, millennia to defend themselves against invading phages or the introduction of other foreign DNA. And so this system is a three-step process whereupon a phage first infects a bacterial uh, cell and then it triggers its immune response. And so one of the first things that happens is that the bacterial will incorporate, will acquire the DNA, this foreign DNA from the phage and incorporate it into its own genome. And these sequences are, the sequence is then used to produce what are called guide RNAs produce what are called guide RNAs. And these guide RNAs then work in concert with endogenous Cas proteins to then target them to digest away any foreign DNA that it might encounter upon subsequent infection with the phage or a similar phage. And so CRISPR technologies really harness the machinery that is uh, involved in the last two steps of this system. And so that is to say that we can design these guide RNAs to interact with Cas nucleases in such a way that they can then bind to their target nucleic acids and direct them to digest these nucleic acids away. And so the hallmark of CRISPR-based technologies is really the RNA-mediated targeting that is dictated by the guide RNA, the Cas nucleases that are involved, the nucleic acids that they target, that is either DNA or RNA, and then the cleavage specificity of the digestion, which is to say where and what nucleic acids are digested away. And so in much of the technology that we've been developing at the Broad, we have been working primarily with the Cas13 nuclease, which specifically targets RNA. And so when the guide RNA and the Cas13 protein bind together, they target the RNA, and then they not only digest away their target RNA, but they also non-specifically digest away any RNA, any other RNA that may be present. And so we and a couple of other labs at the Bro joined forces a few years ago to develop a diagnostic workflow that involved coupling target, uh, upstream target amplification and transcription with downstream CRISPR-based detection. And so again, because Cas13 exhibits this non-specific digestion, we could throw in RNA reporters into the mix, and thereby allowing us to amplify and detect the signal. And we call this, well, before I go into that, I'd like to just point out that I hope you can appreciate that there's actually, this workflow allows for two layers of sensitivity, one from amplifying the target, and another from signal amplification from the, the CRISPR-based detection. But it also allows for up to two layers of specificity based on the primers that we choose to amplify the target, as well as the guides that we design to um, guide the Cas nuclease. And so we called this uh, workflow SHERLOCK, which stands for Specific High Sensitivity Enzymatic Reporter Unlocking. And what we found was that SHERLOCK can achieve atomolar sensitivity. And so, and we can also, based on the guide, the guide RNA design, we can also speciate between different bacteria. So for the experiment shown on the right panel, 
we, our target was Pseudomonas originosa uh, uh, DNA. And so you can see that only when it is in the presence and targeted by a Pseudomonas originosa specific guide RNA do we detect a Sherlock signal. And so with, these, uh, with this result, the natural next extension for us was really to apply this to TB. And so the first thing we did was to see how much of the TB genome we could actually cover and detect by CRISPR. And it turns out that we can cover nearly 80% of the RV genome, which is to say that we can actually design these guide RNAs whose sequence are highly conserved amongst the MTB complex, but then exclusive of MTMs and human genome. And collectively, these guide RNAs can target up to 80% of the RV genome. And so, you know, admittedly, we are still learning about the rules of guide design every day. But as a first pass, we took one such uh, guide that targets a small portion of a hundred base pair region of the TB genome that we knew existed as a single copy um, in the TB genome. And we ran it through Sherlock, and we were able to detect this copy down to 0 0.03 genomes per microliter. And sort of as a point of comparison, the gene expert has a reported analytical sensitivity of its heminested PCR down to about 0 0.05 genomes per microliter, so comparable in sensitivity. And then we wanted to see whether we could do a little bit better than that. And so the next thing we did was to design guides that targeted the IS6110 uh, genetic element in TB. As many of you may know, this uh, particular genetic element is present roughly 16 times in the genome. And so we ran this target, we ran this target and these guides through the Sherlock, and sure enough, we were able to improve sensitivity by an order of magnitude. And so with these results, what we're currently working on are designing primers that can be highly multiplexed to see if we can further improve sensitivity. We're also using an isothermal amplification method with an eye towards point of care and field deployable applications. I should probably point out that the previous results that I um, just showed, we used PCR amplification um, as the method, but the original Sherlock paper did use uh, an isothermal amplification method, namely RPA. So we do have some sense that RPA will be compatible with downstream CRISPR detection. And finally, we're also looking to apply Sherlock to detect cell-free DNA. And so, as many of you have probably know, the diagnostic potential of cell-free DNA was really pioneered in the fields of oncology and obstetrics. And for those who may be a little less familiar with cell-free DNA, it really just refers simply to the nucleic acids that are found in the acellular fraction of blood and other bodily fluids. And so at least what we've learned from oncology and obstetrics is that we believe that these DNA are either secreted directly into the bloodstream or they're released after apoptotic or necrotic events. And so that results in measurable amounts of cell-free DNA in the blood. And what we think they, they exist um, as highly fragmented um, segments in the blood, roughly 150 base pairs in length. And we think that they circulate, the amount that circulates in the blood varies with disease state. And so more recently, the field of infectious diseases has sort of leveraged the presence of cell-free DNA as a potential for a diagnostic marker of disease. And so Claudia already showed this um, figure but this figure comes from a recent study that she and others at FINE led to survey the existing literature about using cell-free DNA in TB diagnostic. And much like cell-free DNA that is derived from tumors or growing fetuses, those that are derived from bacteria are also believed to be released into the blood, which are then eventually distributed to other bodily fluids, such as urine or saliva or CSF. And so from the perspective of a product developer of TB diagnostics, this offers many benefits. Because it's present in non-invasive bodily fluids, this actually points to, this actually is beneficial for point of care and field deployable applications. It also avoids bacterial lysis. And this is particularly significant um, given how notoriously difficult it is to lyse MTB. However, the use of cell-free DNA is not without its own challenges. Again, it is also believed to exist as highly fragmented pars, roughly about 100 to 150 base pairs long. And it is not clear at the moment whether these fragments, these cell-free DNA fragments, collectively represent the whole TB genome. And so this is a particularly key and relevant point because it stands in stark contrast to many of the nucleic acid tests that are currently out there, which 
obtain clinical samples that contain whole bugs. And these bugs are then lysed and whole genomes are extracted and then used for targeting and testing. However, in the case of cell-free DNA, if your test actually only targets one or even several parts of the genome, if that, if that cell-free DNA isn't present in your bodily fluid, then what actually happens is you don't get a signal, but that would actually be a false negative signal. And so we think that Sherlock is uniquely poised to solve these challenges because the length of the guide RNAs are only about 28 nucleotides long, and we can design them to target any part of the genome. And so, as I showed you earlier, we've already determined that roughly 80 percent of the TB genome can be targeted in this way. And so, I just wanted to leave you with one final um, piece of data that um, is unpublished piece of data from a, um, a separate but related project. And this project, um, we designed guides that can distinguish between 50 different bacterial pathogens that account for roughly 95 percent of clinical infections. And in this, in, in this experiment, we amplified a gene that was present in all 50 bacterial species, and then we targeted it with 50 different guides to be able to speciate between each uh, bacterium. And here is the heat map of the Sherlock signal that we get. And so on the y-axis, we plotted the species-specific guide RNA. On the x-axis, we plotted the bacterial species in the same order. So what that means is that the guide RNA that is located in position one on the y-axis is meant to target the bacterial species in position one on the x-axis, and the guide in position two targets the guide, uh, targets the bacteria in position two of the x-axis. So in an ideal and perfect situation, what we would hope to see is um, a signal along the diagonal, which as you can see from our results here, is more or less what we get with just a little bit of cross-reactivity. And so finally, just sort of taking a step back and projecting out into the future towards a fully integrated point of care diagnostic, we envision, and our goal really is to couple our CRISPR-mediated system with a downstream lateral flow strip. And already, Feng Zhang's group at the Broad Institute has already demonstrated this feasibility by simply modifying the Sherlock workflow just a little bit with its reagents, we can actually detect the readout of the, of the CRISPR signal on a lateral flow strip. We're also, we'd also like to um, couple our CRISPR detection with an upstream sample prep uh, method. And to that end, we've been, we've just recently um, entered into a collaboration with the Benai Lab at Stanford, who's investigating and really optimizing the pre-analytical variables that impact the collection and the preparation of cell-free DNA from blood and urine. And so, as you can see, I think a lot of the puzzle pieces are there, and it's really just a matter of time before we can put these puzzle pieces together towards a fully integrated TB diagnostic that we can use at the point of care. And so with that, I'd like to just acknowledge Dev Hung, who's the PI of the lab at the Broad, and all the researchers in her lab who work on this project. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Sharon. Any questions from the audience on that? I think we have time for two questions before we break for coffee. Very exciting. Uh, is your system able to detect uh, mutations? Yes, it is, depending on how you design the guide. And this is really sort of the power of these guide designs, which we're learning the rules of, new rules of every day. But yes, you can detect uh, it's, the specificity is down to a single nucleotide. So um, in fact, the original Sherlock paper actually did um, demonstrate the ability to detect cancer mutations. And so you can imagine we can easily use this test, not easily, but we can eventually translate this test into an AST test. I don't see any other questions, maybe from my side, Sharon. Uh, is there currently a commercial test in which you could see the technology actually being translated into? Uh, is, there, is there already a platform out there that could fit 
the, the Sherlock technology with the appropriate sample prep, or would this be a completely new platform development necessary for such a test? So this would probably be a brand new platform, a brand new test. I mean, this would be a brand new test for sure. Um, but we definitely need to figure out the sample prep step, um, and which is a non-trivial step, actually. I think many of these tests and these diagnostic assays, they sort of don't really address the elephant in the room, which is how do you actually get your target from a clinical sample? Um, but you know, the, the amplification method, the RPA method that we're currently exploring is actually, of all of the amplification methods, it's one that has been shown to be amenable to work with crude samples. So we think that the reagents of this particular amplification method, which is why we chose it, um, will be at least a little bit more amenable to working with not fully purified CFDNA. Thank you very much. So very early but very exciting and I think this is a good time to break for coffee. Um, we would like to ask you to come back uh, at uh, 10.30, so five minutes uh, after the scheduled time to come back. And please use it to ask the questions to the speakers that you weren't able to ask during the session. Thank you. Thank you. We are restarting. I would like to invite now, for the second part of our session, Dr. Rishi Gupta, who is going to talk about uh, a systematic review on signatures for incipient TB. Dr. Gupta is a clinician in respiratory medicine and doctoral fel research fellow at University College London. His previous research experience includes work at uh, in Cape Town and at Public Health England uh, and at Public Health England. His current research aims to develop new tools to refine the risk stratification of individuals with latent TB for progression to TB disease using a combination of epidemiological and host transcriptonomic methods. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. So now, speakers, please, uh, you have a, a gentleman who will show you uh, your, when you have two minutes, and thank you very much. Okay, thank you for the introduction. So my name is Rishi Gupta. I'm a respiratory physician and a doctoral research fellow at University College London. And thank you very much for this opportunity to present our work today. So we now consider the natural history of TB to be a spectrum. And for the purpose of this talk, I'll refer to incipient TB as the asymptomatic phase of early disease between latent infection and active TB. So our current latent TB diagnostics do not differentiate these different phases. As a result, their ability to predict incident TB disease is therefore fairly limited with a positive predictive value estimated in the region of 1 to 5% over a two-year period. There is therefore an urgent need for us to discover novel biomarkers which detect the incipient phase in order to better identify people who are at highest risk of progression to TB disease. And this approach is outlined in this WHO target product profile document, um, which was outlined earlier and published in 2017. So now there's been a huge amount of interest in the whole blood transcriptome in TB in recent years. It's now very clear from a multitude of publications that marked perturbation of the blood transcriptome occurs in the context of active TB disease. And this has led to the discovery and validation of multiple candidate blood RNA signatures for the diagnosis of active TB. More recently, it's been shown that these changes in the whole blood transcriptome predate a clinical TB diagnosis. And this has raised a huge amount of hope that perhaps these blood RNA signatures could be exciting candidates as biomarkers for incipient TB. 
However, it has been so far unclear which of the many candidate signatures performs best for diagnosis of incipient TB, or in fact, whether any of these candidates meets the global benchmarks that have been set out by the WHO target product profile. So in this study, we firstly aim to compare the predictive ability of candidate blood RNA signatures for diagnosis of incipient TB, and secondly, to then evaluate the performance of the best signatures from our first objective, stratified by interval from sampling to TB diagnosis, and to benchmark these findings against the WHO target product profile criteria. So our overarching aim here was really to critically appraise the true potential value of these biomarkers for incipient TB. So we started by performing a systematic review. The purpose of this was twofold. Firstly, it helped us to identify candidate whole blood RNA signatures for the diagnosis of either incipient or active TB. And secondly, it helped to identify published whole blood RNA data sets where we had blood sampling um, coupled with prospective follow-up for development of incident TB disease. And we then sought to test the performance of our candidate RNA signatures from A in the whole blood data sets from part B. I'll now briefly talk you through our analysis workflow. So we started with our raw RNA data from the eligible contributing studies. We mapped these data to a common reference transcriptome and then performed some batch correction to account for technical differences between the RNA sequencing methods of the contributing studies. We then calculated scores for our signatures of interest and we aimed to use the author's original described methods wherever possible here. We used these scores to plot receiver operating characteristic curves for the diagnosis of incipient TB over a two-year interval from uh, initial blood sampling to diagnosis of TB disease. We did this both within separate data sets and then acro across a common pooled data set. We then took the signature that had the highest ROC AUC in the common pool data set and used this as a reference. We then compared the performance of each of the other candidate signatures to this reference um, and essentially defined those that had statistically equivalent performance as being the best performing subset. For these best performing signatures, we then examined ROC curves, sensitivity, specificities, and predictive values stratified by predefined intervals to TB diagnosis and tried to benchmark these findings against the WHO target parameters. So on to the results. This slide just summarizes our systematic review process. Our search was conducted in April of this year, and we identified a total of four eligible whole blood RNA data sets with sampling prior to TB diagnosis and 17 candidate RNA signatures that met our inclusion criteria. I'll now briefly summarize the four RNA data sets. So these included a London TB contact study done by our own group at UCL, the South African adolescent cohort study, the Grand Challenges 674 study done in multiple African settings, and a further UK TB contact study done in Leicester. So all of these studies recruited HIV negative adults and adoles adolescents, um, and we included a total of 1,126 samples in our meta-analysis, including 183 samples from incipient TB cases. Now this slide summarizes our 17 candidate signatures that we included. I won't go through this in detail other than to say they included anywhere between one and 51 gene transcripts. They required a range of methods to actually calculate the signature scores. Some of them were very simple formally, whilst others required reconstruction of more complex models, such as support vector machines or random forests. So we found that eight signatures in our analysis had equivalent performance for identification of incipient TB. These eight signatures are listed here and range from a single transcript to 25 genes. This heat map shows Spearman rank correlation between all 17 of our candidate signatures. The eight top signatures here are highlighted in yellow and were all moderately to highly co-correlated. So next, we examined the upstream regulators of the 40 genes that make up these top eight signatures. Oops, sorry. Yeah, so the 40 genes that make up these signatures listed here, which are the top performing ones, and we found that these were predominantly regulated by interferon and TNF signaling, suggesting that e these top eight signatures are very likely to reflect a common underlying host immune response to MTB. 
So I'll now summarize the rock curves and areas under the curve for the top heat signatures um, stratified by interval to TB diagnosis. So you'll see that the areas under the curve tend to be higher at shorter intervals to disease. So over a 24-month period from sampling to TB diagnosis, the eight signatures had AECs in the region of 0.7 to 0.77, whereas over a three-month interval, these rose to 0.82 to 0.91. I'll now go through this in more detail. Um, so these plots show sensitivity versus specificity of our top eight signatures again in rock space, but we're now using biomarker cutoffs to prioritize specificity in order to try to maximize our positive predictive value. So over a 24 month interval to disease, these eight signatures had sensitivities of only in the region of 25 to 50%, but with high specificities of above 90%. These diagonal lines here represent planes of positive predictive value. So for these eight signatures over a 24 month period, this translates to a PPV in the region of seven to 9%. In contrast, over a three month interval to disease, the sensitivities rise to 50 to 80% with similarly high specificities above 90. And this translates to improved PPV of in the region of 11 to 14%. And I hope you can appreciate from these plots that for both time intervals, the top eight signatures cluster quite tightly together, which reaffirms our finding of similar diagnostic accuracy. Shown another way, we've now, um, we now use biomarker cutoffs that give equal weighting to both sensitivity and specificity. These are benchmarked here against the WHO target criteria, the minimum criteria in gray and the optimal in black. So over a 24 month interval, none of these top eight signatures meet the minimum criteria, even when you take into account the 95% confidence intervals highlighted in gray. In contrast, over a three month interval, all eight of the signatures meet or approximate these minimum criteria. So to summarize our key findings, we found that in an adult and adolescent HIV negative population, the eight RNA signatures comprising anywhere between one and 25 individual transcripts had similar performance for identification of incipient TB. And these are very, li very likely to reflect different ways of measuring a common underlying host immune response to TB. For each of these signatures, their accuracy declined markedly with increasing interval to TB diagnosis. And as a result, they only meet the, the WHO minimum parameters over a relatively short three to six month interval. Our study does have a number of important limitations that, that I'll briefly outline. So firstly, unfortunately, no subgroup analyses, for example, by age or ethnicity were possible since the contributing data sets largely separated by these variables. Secondly, in our primary analysis, which was a one stage meta analysis approach, we assumed common diagnostic accuracy across studies. We did, however, perform a sensitivity analysis where we used a two-stage approach with random effects, allowing for between-study heterogeneity with very similar findings. And finally, the contributing data sets were limited to sub-Saharan African and UK settings, so clearly more data are required from other world regions. So to summarize, we found that multiple blood RNA biomarkers perform similarly for incipient TB, so there are multiple solutions to this problem. However, we do need to be aware of the limitations of these biomarkers since they only really predict short-term risk of TB disease well over perhaps three to six months. I should also highlight, however, that there is still some evidence that the incipient phase may still extend even beyond 12 months in some cases. As a result, we think that a, a strategy of serial testing among carefully selected risk groups, for example, recent household contacts, may be required for optimal implementation of these biomarkers. And we think this is a really important finding since it has clear implications for the feasibility of implementing these biomarkers, particularly when trying to achieve scale and when taking into account costs. And if anyone would like further details, um, this work is publicly available as a preprint and bioarchive and is now in press with the Lancet Respiratory Medicine. So I'll end there by thanking you all very much for listening with my acknowledgements to the UCL study team, but also the investigators and participants of the primary studies that contributed data to the meta-analysis. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. We have time for two or three questions.
was wondering if the lower specificity is due to biological non-specificity or is it an analytical non-specificity? Um, so I, th I think that's an, uh, an interesting question. For, for the purposes of this analysis, um, using these biomarkers for incipient TB, our primary goal for the most part is trying to differentiate people with sort of impending or subclinical active disease versus a largely healthy population. So for this setting, um, for, for this application, any lack of specificity is probably related to the biomarkers themselves. However, we do also have a parallel study uh, to this, which was done in a South African cohort when we were looking at si a similar panel of biomarkers to differentiate TB versus other diseases um, amongst the respiratory symptomatic population. And actually, we found that the specificity in that context was actually surprisingly good. Um, that's post the P20 if anyone wants further details. Thanks. Um, thanks, Rashi. That's um, really mm -hmm. interesting. And Liz Corbett from London School. Um, just, just to, so, so I, I think this is, we hear this sort of again and again with um, um, prediction of disease. And I'm just wondering how much you think, you know, you're truly picking up a kind of active latent state versus just early detection of, of undiagnosed um, active disease which, as we know, can take months and years t to be diagnosed. So that's one question. You know, plus, you know, does it matter? And then the th finally, uh, um, uh, can you say anything about time from I exposure? So, so some of your UK cohorts, you know, have got a very time-limited exposure. Um, so um, are you picking, do you get any increased sensitivity or specificity? around very recently infected individuals? Fine, so um, I'll, I'll answer your second question first. So um, I think it's really interesting to look at whether there's any difference in biomarker performance amongst contacts, for example, particularly in a low transmission setting where they've had an index exposure event, as you say. Overall, the pattern of the performance of these biomarkers is, is quite similar across the different study populations, so the UK contacts and also the general population um, studies, for example, the adolescent cohort study from South Africa. However, I think that's a really important thing to take into account when, um, when considering the time sensitivity of these biomarkers. For example, we know in contact, particularly in a low incidence setting, the highest risk of disease is in the first one to two years after exposure. And that's why we think the probably is, might actually be the greatest opportunity for these biomarkers given that they may require a strategy of serial testing. So in a low incident setting, we currently do an IGRA at baseline and stratified treatment on that basis, but perhaps a, uh, an alternative strategy may be to do a, a RNA biomarker at baseline after six months, and that may well end up picking up a lot of the incident disease amongst the contacts. In terms of your, um, your first question, I, I think you're right. The, the margins between sort of prevalent and incident TB and latent and active TB are being increasingly blurred over time. And a lot of that depends on how intensively your population is investigated. Um, for the studies that contributed data here, they had quite pragmatic criteria to exclude prevalent TB at baseline using symptom screens and then um, the UK studies also did systematic chest radiographs, but it's difficult to tell really given that they, the circumstances largely reflected routine programmatic conditions, whether they would have actually had clinical evidence of active TB if you'd really looked hard for it. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank Gupta, you. and we will move now for, move on to the next presentation. Our next speaker would be Dr. Gerard Kanjilozi, Professor of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences and Adjunct Professor of Global Health and Epidemiology at the University of Washington. His, his research focuses on diagnosis and epidemiology of infectious diseases. And uh, he would be speaking on oral swab analysis for diagnosis of adult and pediatric pulmonary tuberculosis. All right, uh, well, thank you for the introduction, and I want to thank um, the organizers for inviting me to speak, and also I want to thank the previous speakers for uh, really helping set up this topic of um, non-sputum diagnosis of TB. Um, 
there are lots of good reasons to want to pursue uh, uh, alternatives to sputum. Uh, sputum is difficult to obtain from many patients, can be very difficult to standardize and process, especially at point of care, and so we've heard a couple of uh, comments about that in earlier talks. Um, it's occupationally hazardous for health workers to collect, and um, it's not amenable to active case finding um, on, on a very large scale. So these are some of the alternative samples that have been explored in recent years, and some of them have been discussed in this session. Um, they all have various strengths and weaknesses, and so there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution. Our solution is oral swab analysis, and especially tongue swabs. So basically, in our technique, we uh, start with a uh, disposable uh, swab, and we uh, scrape the uh, dorsum of the tongue for just about 10 seconds. And um, that sample goes into a transport buffer, about a half middle transport buffer, which is uh, tested by uh, nucleic acid amplification testing. So the big advantage here, the, the button that we're pushing here is ease of sampling. Um, anybody who has a tongue can be sampled in just a few seconds. And it's no exaggeration to say that uh, we could sample everybody in this room during the course of this morning's session, and none of you would have to get out of your seat. Um, all of you could attend all of the talks. <laughs> So um, uh, when you're actually thinking about actively screening an entire factory or entire gold mine or entire prison, um, this is a really good uh, thing to consider. So um, some of the people that <clears throat> have uh, contributed to the work that I'll be talking about are at, uh, in our department at University of Washington, especially Rachel Wood, and um, also uh, South African Tuberculosis Vaccine Initiative, especially Angelique Luabea. And I'll also uh, tell you about some new data that has come out in collaboration with workers at Global Good and University of California, uh, San Francisco, and <clears throat> Macquarie University in Kampala. So uh, Rachel started all this about uh, five years ago with a very small analysis that uh, she did with eight, uh, 20 uh, expert positive subjects in South Africa and 20 healthy controls. and. Um, Using a buckle swab method, a cheek swab method, uh, she got fairly good results, 90% sensitivity, 100% um, specificity, but this is a small unblinded sample, and you can tell we're kind of cheating a little bit. Uh, she compared three swabs per subject to one sputum per subject, so obviously that's cheating a little bit. Um, we then went on and did a larger study uh, that was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and jointly by the NIH with 138 uh, combined gene expert uh, positive uh, subjects and um, about 70 uh, uh, controls. And this was a better structured study and blinded, uh, done blinded. So we found, and in this case, we uh, sampled different parts of the mouths, tongues, gums, cheeks, and also used a couple different swab products. And one of the things we found is that tongue swabs work significantly better than cheek swabs. So CQ values are um, a measure of um, the cycle time to get an, a signal. So the smaller the CQ value, the stronger the signal. And you can see we got much stronger um, signals with tongue swabs, uh, tongue omni swabs, than with uh, cheek omni swabs. A 6 CQ value difference uh, corresponds to about a 64-fold difference in DNA. And also we found that uh, certain swab products work better than others. So the uh, uh, pure flock swab applied to the cheek got, gave you slightly better signals than the, uh, than the omni swab. So when we use our best combination here, tongue swabs with uh, the pure flock, we got uh, similar sensitivity and specificity as the previous study, but we were able to do it with two swabs per subject. So we're cheating a little bit less, but we're still cheating. Um, so why <clears throat> is there more MTB DNA on tongue swabs than on cheek swabs? Um, it's not because it's collecting more uh, human cells. We get about the same amount of human cells on both of these uh, 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 sites. But when we look at total bacterial DNA, we're getting a lot more uh, bacterial DNA from the tongue than from the gum. So that whitish slime that you see on Miley's tongue there, that's bacterial biofilm. And um, that's basically what we're collecting with these, uh, with these uh, samples. And that got us thinking, are we collecting everything that we can collect? And so this was a study that was done on volunteers in Seattle. And um, basically, we collected 10 samples in a row, just uh, about 10 seconds apart, collecting just 10 samples. Your mouth gets a little dry after a while when you're, when you're having this happen to you. But what we found is that the total bacterial, uh, 
total bacterial DNA in healthy uh, subjects basically doesn't change at all over 10 samplings. So we're only collecting just a small fraction of the biomass that's available in these sites uh, for testing. It's like collecting a mil, uh, 10 mils of sputum and throwing away nine, nine mils and testing only the one. And then using the same proxy uh, in terms of bacterial biomass, um, we find that certain products collect more of this material than others. So copan flock swabs collect about twice as much uh, bacterial DNA as Puritan pure flocks. And then going back to a clinical study, using copan flock swabs on the tongue, we're now able to get a similar level of sensitivity with just one swab per subject. So about 90% sensitivity relative to sputum expert. We didn't get as good uh, specificity on this one, and I think that's because we do manual PCR. And that's something I should emphasize. If this sounds uh, too good to be true, um, the, the, the issue is that we have not yet gotten this to work with um, uh, gene expert. We're just starting, we're working on it. Um, uh, we may get to that point, but for now we're doing this by manual PCR. But in any case, with 90% uh, sensitivity relative to expert in a non-invasive sample, we are now getting uh, close to something that can be used for triage. We've also tried this out on children. Uh, the issue with children, it's very difficult to get um, sputum from children uh, in a, uh, study at University of Cape Town with Mark Nickel and Heather Zarr and co-workers. As usual with uh, children, we get three groups. We get confirmed TB who are uh, induced sputum culture positive, unlikely DP who are induced sputum culture negative and not treated. And there's always this intermediate group of unconfirmed TB that are, who are culture negative on two induced sputums, uh, but they were clinically diagnosed as likely to have TB and treated. And among the confirmed group, we didn't do that well. We actually uh, were not as sensitive as um, using two swabs. We were not as sensitive as one sputum gene expert. But um, in the unconfirmed group, we, did, uh, we were able to detect a significant portion of these, of these subjects. And we know that these are um, likely to be, some of these are likely to be real TB cases because the um, percentage is significantly higher than in the unlikely TB group. So um, it's possible then that oral swabs can get to one of the uh, goals of this session, which is to try to uh, find some of the missing millions. Okay, so um, finally, uh, some additional studies that we're starting now. So oral swabs as, um, as swabs, as, as samples for diagnosis of tuberculosis, it has unique advantages and unique disadvantages. Compared to a sputum sample, a swab is relatively clean. It doesn't have a lot of gook, gunk that you need to clean up in order to remove the inhibitors of your assays. Um, however, there's probably not a lot of bacilli there compared to uh, a, a sputum sample. So um, something like Gene Expert, which is miraculous at processing sputum in, uh, in an automated way, might be overkill for swabs. And so we are in the process of trying to um, I, uh, identify processing uh, protocols that really exploit the unique advantages of swabs. We need uh, to emphasize yield over, um, over purification. So um, oral swabs by design are very easy to add to any clinical protocol. And um, if you're thinking of, of adding it to your protocol, here's the advice based on what I just, uh, what I just spoke about. Use tongue swabs. Um, if you're using buckle swabs, stop and start using tongue swabs. Um, the flock swabs work better than products that we've reported on in the past. Choose your analytical method well. Unfortunately, we're not yet at the point where you can just take a swab sample and stick it in a gene expert cartridge. We might get there, but we're not there yet. And if you're going to do this, call us or write to us because we're continuously um, improving this. And uh, I, I told you about the first three generations. We're now working on the fourth generation of this. And don't just plow forward with something that we published a year or two ago. So I want to thank uh, our funders, and hopefully I left time for questions. Thank you. I was just wondering, um, I mean, uh, you have briefly touched on the biofilm. If you think that it would be better to try to get uh, swaps from kind of the teeth, um, ginger, like, yeah. you know, that area, because the biofilm obviously will be dramatically high, higher, yeah, especially right. in the mornings. 
Yeah. So I wonder if the time of the day is, a, is an issue, and if you think that that might be an area of particularly high yield. So um, time of day, we did report that uh, we get slightly stronger signals when we collect samples first things in the morning. So it's a lot like, it's, it's sort of like sputum sampling in that regard. Uh, we do get, we didn't really see, we didn't have the numbers to, diff, to um, say that we had better sensitivity in the morning, but we got slightly stronger PCR signals. We did try the gums, we did not try the teeth and the uh, gingival crevices. Um, you know, I suppose you could use a paper point, but our whole emphasis here is ease of sampling. That's what we're trying to do. And so if you're getting to the point where you're, you gotta get into a dentist chair, the dentist is sampling your gingival crevices, that's gonna kinda defeat the purpose a little bit. The tongue, we think, has more bacterial biomass and more TB just for architectural reasons. It's got the papillae, which just collect a lot of stuff that comes out of your mouth <laughs> during the night. So that's our, that's our hypothesis, but um, we don't know the exact answer to your question. Thank yes. you very one much. One more question. Uh, Luis Cuevas from the School of Tropical Medicine in Liverpool. Um, I wonder whether you have done repetitive sampling to see if this is something that is constant. Or yeah. How long does it stay positive? And if does it correlate to any immunological marker of infection? Okay, we have not uh, compared it to immunological markers of infection. We're just we're just uh, benchmarking it to um, culture, sputum culture and sputum gene expert. Um, we have repeatedly, like I said, we repeat, repeatedly sampled the tongue dorsum and the bacterial biomass doesn't change. So we're only collecting a small fraction of what's there. I suspect the same would be true of tuberculosis and it would certainly make some of our studies and our evaluations easier if that's true. Um, I can't tell you for sure, but, but so far, uh, I didn't tell you about all of it, but we find that the TB signal in TB patients tends to parallel the bacterial biomass. So it's likely that the bacilli are just getting entrained in that biomass. Thank you so much, Dr. Cantorosi. We can, if there are further questions, can be either asked on the ASCAP or uh, through lunch. We move on to the next speaker. Yep. So next is my pleasure to introduce Roger Calderon, who is. Uh, heading the laboratory uh, in Peru of doctors without, uh, sorry, not doctors, <laughs> partners in health. Um, and he is going to do what Jerry said not to do, is uh, buccal swabs um, in children. So we'll see what uh, the results of this is. Um, Roger, are you here? Oh, different speaker. Oh, sorry. Um, Yeah, so unfortunately, Roger's flight didn't arrive in time, so I will do my best and substitute him and deliver this presentation for him. Um, my name is Annelies Messmann. Uh, I'm a research fellow at um, uh, Harvard Sco Medical School. Um, and indeed, after the call in the previous talk for tongue swabs, I hope I will not disappoint you with this data. Um, so to start with a brief introduction, most of this has already been said in a previous talk, so I will try to keep it short. One of the main challenges in a pediatric TB is the um, confirmation of disease, the microbiological confirmation of disease. Um, first of all, this is because in conventional tests you use sputum, uh, which is difficult to collect and most children do not produce a sputum sample. And secondly, the sensitivity of all these tests, the smearing culture is very low in this group. And as this slide shows, also other techniques that are used for TB screening and TB diagnosis are often uh, challenging, not available, or not feasible in children, um, including um, X-ray, PPD, um, and symptom screening and medical history. So there's a large need for an accurate test with high sensitivity and specificity for children. Um, and ideally this would be, be um, with a sample that is easy to collect, non-invasive, um, and has a low risk of transmission. Um, and in recent years, um, some promising data have been shown, have been reported about um, buckle swaps. So this has already also been shown. This is all work from the previous speaker. Um, this was the first study of their group and in the second study in which indeed they changed some of the collection methods. Oh. 
Thank you. Um, including switching to a um, tongue swap and using multiple uh, samples per patient, um, they got even even higher yields. And this was all in um, studies in adults um, and comparing to sputum expert testing. So in our study, we wanted to examine the sensitivity and specificity of MTB detection in oral swabs from children, all with suspected TB. And this study was part of a larger uh, cohort study that took place between 2015 and 2018 in Lima, Peru. So we um, enrolled 628 children below the age of 15 years old, and we collected a number of different specimens from these children, including oral swabs, to um, try to detect TB using molecular methods. Um, all these children presented to health centers with TB symptoms, and they were examined um, according to national guidelines. So they all had an x-ray, um, medical examination, and we also uh, collected gastric aspirate or sputum for smear and culture. Um, we only started collecting swab samples um, throughout the implementation of this study, so we don't have results for all the children, um, but we used from the children from whom we collected swaps, we used one of two methods. Um, either we used an omni swap, so we did um, um, swap in the cheek, and after this, this swap was transferred to a lysis medium and frozen until processing. Or we used, um, we collected the sample on FDA collection cards, so this was done with uh, a sponge in the cheek and then this was pressed onto this card. So this can be stored at four degrees, which could potentially be easier in the field. And then after collection, um, we did DNA extraction using Kyogen kits and then amplification of IS6110 uh, using real-time PCR. So also the use of um, in-house testing. So to come to our results of the 256 children from whom we uh, collected the buccal swab sample, 87 were diagnosed with TB, um, of whom only 23 had a culture confirmed diagnosis and seven were smear positive. And in the remaining 66%, uh, TB was ruled out. So most of the children with a diagnosis were only diagnosed based on um, clinical symptoms. So this is the um, results for the uh, children from whom we collected a sample uh, using the omni swaps. So among the children who were smear positive, so that's a very small group of children, uh, we detected TB in 60%. In, among all the culture confirmed cases, uh, 36%. We did not find TB in any of the samples from the children with, who were clinically diagnosed and culture negative and the overall specificity was 100%. And then for the FDA cards, um, we detected only TB in one of the samples from, well, one kid who was diagnosed with um, culture-confirmed TB, and this kid was also smear positive. Um, and we detected TB in the um, sample from one kid who was clinically diagnosed. And again, the specificity was 100%. So to summarize this, um, these results are potentially promising, um, but as the previous speaker said, we hope to increase sensitivity using this test by changing some of the collection procedures. Um, and we unfortunately are not able to compare the OmniSwap with the FDA performance using these data because of, well, either both the small sample size and because we only had one of each samples from these children. So I would especially like to acknowledge um, Roger Calderon, seen here on the right, who is the head of our socios and salute lab in Peru, uh, and the rest of the socios team, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, and thank you for jumping in on short notice. Questions? Is a question back there? I was wondering if you are quantifying um, it or just detecting through real-time PCR. 
um, IS-6110, are you quantifying it or just detecting it through real-time PCR, say detected, not detected? Um, yeah, at the current moment, we only say detected or non-detected. Okay, thank you. Good. Well, thank you very much again. We're now moving to another presentation on uh, LEM test for HIV people in Ghana. Uh, it will be presented by Dr. Stephanie Bieram, who is a Danish medical doctor specialized in infectious diseases and holding a postdoc position in international health, hosted by uh, University of Southern Denmark and Aga Khan University Nairobi, Kenya. Yes, so thank you for that introduction and thank you very much for the opportunity to come here and present on behalf of uh, the whole study team. I'm presenting the results of our diagnostic accuracy study of the urine Fuji Lam test uh, to diagnose TB among people living with HIV and it's based on data and participants from Ghana. So these are our disclosures. Several of the authors are from FIND, and I think Claudia already mentioned how uh, important FIND is contributing. And then Fujilam did not participate in the co-authorship. So just to give a little background, we are aware of this massive burden of HIV, TB, uh, but as of in the report of 2018, only 51% of the TB cases among people living with HIV were actually diagnosed and notified. So coming to our local um, study setting in Ghana, the incidence there is 148 new TB cases per 100,000 as of 2018. And the national data suggests that actually the TB case detection in Ghana was as low as 32%. So since 2015, WHO has been recommended the determined TB LAM or the ALEA LAM for TB diagnosis among people living with HIV, and this is people that are severely sick or with a very low CD4 cell count. And we just uh, published a Cochrane systematic review on the determine allure LAM test, and among people living with HIV and presenting with TB signs and symptoms, the sensitivity uh, was 42%, and the specificity was found at 95%. So a bit earlier this year, Tobias Broga and Al published the first accuracy study on the Fujifilm LAM test. That was conducted among patients that were hospitalized, and they were quite severely sick with a median CD4 as low as uh, 86 uh, cells per microliter. They found that the sensitivity was 70% versus 42% for the Alluia LAM test. The specificity for both tests were above 90%. So we set off to compare the diagnostic accuracy, uh, the diagnostic accuracy of Fujilam versus Alialam among people living with HIV, but with a lower pretest probability, such as outpatients and across CD4 cell count. You see the two tests are here. We have the Fujifilm LAM test here in the, in the top, and then the Alialam here. And they are both very simple tests where you use a few drops of urine and they will be, provide you with a result within a short time. For the Fujilam, it's within an hour, and for the Lialam, within 25 minutes. One of the differences I want to mention here is that the Fujilam provides you with a positive or negative results, whereas the Lialam has to be interpreted against a reference card scale. So we also wanted to assess the association of Fujilam with uh, mortality. So was a positive test of the Fujilam, was it associated with mortality, the same way as we have seen it for Alia Lam. And then we also wanted to see if there is an influence of non-tuberculosis mycobacteria on the test results. We took advantage of another diagnostic accuracy study that was conducted in Ghana back in 2013, and from which we had biobank urine samples and a, and a lot of clinical data. So this study recruited consecutive unselected participants and they were included irrespective of the signs and symptoms that they were presenting with. They were coming as adult referred for ART and at that time 
it was with a CD4 cell count mostly below 350. And we recruited them from both the outpatient and the inpatient departments from the FIVIS unit at Kolobu Teaching Hospital, which is a major referral hospital in Accra. And we followed them for six months. So at the baseline there, we collected sputum and we sent it for microscopy, we sent it for culture, and we sent it for expert as it became available. And then we also collected urine and had it stored at a minus 20 degree. We later tested it uh, with expert assay. And then early this year, we were able to send the, the frozen samples to Japan, to the Research Institute of Tuberculosis there, where the lab did um, simultaneous uh, urine testing of, with the Lam and the Fujilam test. It was interpreted by two independent lab technicians and they were blinded to the other results. So this is just to say that initially for the Detect HIV study, we, we screened 575 participants for eligibility. And for this, our accuracy study on Fujilam, we were able to include 532 participants and we could classify them against our predefined TB diagnostic uh, categorization. We have our definite TB cases here that were defined by either having a positive culture or expert result. We had a possible TB if they were started on an empirical TB treatment, not TB, and then there was a group that we couldn't classify and they were, we called them unclassifiable. So the unclassifiable, we had to take them out from our primary analysis but they were included in secondary sensitivity analysis to see how it would impact the results. <clears throat> so we evaluated Fujilam against a microbiological reference standard, and for that we considered our definite TB as reference standard positive, but we also evaluated it against the uh, composite reference standard, where we included both definite TB cases and possible TB cases as reference standard positive. So these are our baseline characteristics. And as you can see, the majority of our participants were from the outpatient department with more than 86%. Uh, our median CD4 cell count among the whole population was 152, but noted to be markedly less among possible TB cases. We had 62% of the participants with a CD4 beyond 100 and the rest below. What we noted that even though we included participants irrespective of TB signs and symptoms, when we assessed according to the WHO symptom screen, we saw that 86% of them actually had any of the four symptoms of cough, fever, night, sweat, or uh, weight loss. What we also noted was that we had uh, very few participants with a previous history of TB. So the overall result for the Fujilam test was that it was able to detect 74.2% of the TB, and that's the definite TB cases. That is versus the 53% sensitivity for the Alia Lam, a difference of 21% significant. And then the specificity of the Fujilam was 89.3% versus a 95.6% specificity for the Alia Lam. When we consider it the accuracy against a composite reference standard, we saw that the specificity increased for the Fujilam to 92.3, and it also increased for Alia Lam, but it increased more for the Fujilam than the Alia Lam. In our pre-specified subgroup analysis, we saw that the sensitivity of Fujilam increased among the sickest subpopulation. So that could be visualized by uh, this data where you uh, separate by outpatient versus inpatient. We saw that among outpatient, the sensitivity was 68% versus a DLM sensitivity of 44, giving a difference of 23%. We saw that for inpatient, that the sensitivity then increased to 89.5%. So another way of looking at the more sick subpopulation, our pre-specified uh, CD4, uh, we, we stratified by CD4 groups, and it's interesting to see that the sensitivity among participants with CD4 below 100 was 84 versus a 65.6% sensitivity for the Alia Lam. We also saw that there was in this group with participant 
uh, that had CD4 below 100, that the specificity of the Fuji LAM was lowest. It was at 69 versus 87 for the, AT uh, for, for the Allure LAM. But then when we looked at the specificity for participants that had a CD4 beyond 100, we saw that the specificity for Fuji LAM increased to 98.8, similar to the Allure LAM specificity that we found at 99%. And just to tell you also that in the subgroup with CD4 beyond 200, we found still a considerable and significant difference in sensitivity of the Fujilam versus the Alielam. So coming to the number of participants that had non-tuberculosis mycobacteria isolated in sputum, we found that 53 or 10% of our population had NTM isolated in sputum. And I just want us to acknowledge that having NTM isolated in sputum is not the same as having NTM disease. And we could not classify according to standardized, uh, like the American Thoracic Society's uh, classification for, T for NTM disease. But we did see that we had NTM in two sputum specimens for only nine of the 53 cases, and in a single sample for 54 out of the 53. So of those that had a non-tuberculosis microbacteria isolated in sputum, it included 27 not TB cases, seven possible TB cases, 11 that had a mixed infection with TB and non-tuberculosis microbacteria, and eight unclassifiable. So among the participants that, were not, that did not have TB, but had NTM isolated in sputum, we saw that the Fujilam was negative in 25 out of the 27 cases and positive in two cases. And amongst those 25 that had a negative LAM test or Fujilam test, we noted that they were both slow growing NTMs, but also rapid growing NTMs, yielding a negative result. And then in the two cases that had a Fujilam positive test, we found two slow-growing uh, NTMs. We noted that among the possible TB participants, six of the seven had a possible, had the, no, so seven had NTM in the sputum, and six of them had a Fujilam positive test. We also saw that among those with possible TB, their baseline characteristics were quite low, with a median CD4 as low as three and a high mortality. And we again saw a mix of rapid and slow-growing NTMs. So we assessed for mortality at uh, six months, and we had 71 participants that had died within the six months. And Fujilam was positive in 49, almost 50% of the cases uh, by six months versus 35% of the Lear LAM test. We saw here in the Kaplan-Meier curve stratified by LAM status. So we have on the left side here our stratified by Fujilam test result, and on the right side stratified by Alia LAM uh, test results. We saw that Fujilam positivity was associated with mortality, the same way as we also saw it with Alia LAM. When we confined our mortality analysis to the participants that had definite TB, we saw that Fujilam out of the 22 cases that died with HIV TB within the six months, 90.9% of them had a positive Fujilam test versus 81.8 for the Alia LAM test. So small numbers, but still uh, quite striking. And again, when we stratified by LAM test result in the Kaplan Mara curve, we saw an association with a positive test um, with mortality. So, in summary, Fujilam offers higher sensitivity than the Lear LAM test for detection of tuberculosis among outpatients and across CD4 strata. We saw that Fujilam specificity was lower among participants with CD4 less than 100, <clears throat> but misclassification bias are, are quite possible in this group. Fujilam was negative in most of the non-TB patients that had NTM cultured in the sputum, but the impact of NTM on the LAM test results need further studies. And then Fujilam was positive in 91% of the patients with TB HIV that died within six months. We have limitation, and I will just list them shortly. They're mostly related to our reference standard. Um, 
for multiple reasons, and then also on the retrospective testing of the urine sample. So the next step to come is to do prospective studies in clinical site settings where you would collect the urine prospectively and evaluate against a very high quality reference standard, including more than just sputum or urine in the reference standard. So this is just to acknowledge all the investigators, the lab teams in Ghana and in Japan, and the clinical staff, and I also want to acknowledge our funders, and it has been an honor collaborating between all these, uh, all these institutions of FIND, University of Southern Denmark, Japan, and in Ghana as well. Thank you. Thank you. I'm afraid we have no time for questions. I'm sorry. No oh. movement for the next. Thank you. So our next speaker, Dr. Midori Katomida. She started from Mexico. She's a clinician, and she was a subdirector of National TB Control Program there. She's currently associate professor at the University of California, San Francisco, and uh, works on a very interesting field. Uh, she works on novel genomic factors that govern drug-resistant TB. And uh, she likes to understand the treatment outcomes of these drug-resistant mycobacteria their transmission and pathogenesis, and she speak on heteroresistance among patients with drug-resistant TB. Thank you very much uh, to the organizers for allowing us to present our study, heteroresistance among patients with drug-resistant tuberculosis. So the goal of our study is to fundamentally advance the rapid identification of resistance to first and second line anti-tuberculosis drugs. Why? Drug-resistant TB is an ever-increasing global public health threat. Two, a complete drug-resistant profile is critical for effective treatment. It will prevent the acquisition of resistant to additional drugs, and it will improve patient outcome, and therefore public health outcomes. And finally, current molecular tests are inadequate. So what are the limitations? One, they use limited number of targets, usually the most frequent gene uh, mutations associated with drug resistance, and they have a poor resolution. They have inadequate resolution to identify drug resistance when the percentage of the population that is resistant in that sample is below 10 to 20%. So for example, ultra expert requires that at least 10% of the, the bacterial population in the sample have a mutation in the RPOB gene in order to be identified. If it's lower than that, there is a possibility that will not be identified as drug resistant. If we want a method that could be um, useful we want to have a method that could identify these small variants, small proportion of resistant populations. The presence of both susceptible and resistant population is what defines heteroresistance. So there is also an incomplete knowledge of resistant conferring mutations. The sensitivity of HANE for fluoroquinolone resistance is between 57 to 100% and for second-line injectables, between 25 to 100%. This heterogeneity is, is due to the geographic differences in the prevalence of the specific mutations associated with drug resistance. For example, in South Africa, almost 100% of the isolates that are resistant to fluoroquinolones have mutations, known mutations in gyr A and GYR-B. However, there are other regions in the world which where this is not the case. So the project objectives are to one, characterize mutations conferring resistance to first and second line anti-tuberculosis drugs in the Philippines using targeted deep next generation sequencing. Two, to characterize heteroresistance using this method and its association with clinical outcomes. And finally, to identify genetic markers, new genetic markers that predict pre-XDR and XDR phenotypes using whole genome sequencing. So 
We, did, we are doing this study in the Philippines because they are one of the high burden, high TB burden countries and high MDR TB countries. They also have quality assured network of laboratories that perform first and second line anti-tuberculosis drug susceptibility testing. And since 2011, they have banking all drug resistant tuberculosis isolates. So between 2013, 2013 and 2016, there were more than 16,000 isolates and 3,600 were eligible. Our current cohort includes 16XDR, 358 pre-XDR, and 373 MDR that were selected randomly. So we are using targeted deep next generation sequencing, specifically SMORE, single mo molecule overlapping read that was developed by Tijen in Phoenix, Arizona. So here we use multiple PCR, multiplex PCR of targeted genes which are listed here, and each amplicon is tagged so we can do pooled next generation sequencing. At the bioinformatic level, instead of just choosing the most common allele, we actually tabulate each of the reads, each of the type of the reads, how many wild type susceptible reads are, and how many mutations. In this way, we can know which isolates have their resistance, have both susceptible and resistant populations. We use deep sequencing with coverage between 10 and 100,000 X, so we can have certainty that the few mutations that we see are real mutations and non-technical errors because of the sequencing. The rule to identify small population is written here. At least five of 5,000 reads Again, most of the time we obtain 10,000, but five of the 5,000 risks showing the mutant allele were required to identify the presence of small populations at the level of 0.1%. And based on, the based on the percentage of the population with the mutant allele, we classify at the resistant in these three groups. So for example, in rare, so 0.1 to 0.99 of the bacterial population in the sample had the mutant allele that make them resistant. So we have results for 472, 233 MDR, 98 pre-XDR -pre based on second line injectables, 132 pre-XDR based on fluoroquinolone, and 9 XDR TB. And in the pie chart, you can see the proportion of MTB isolates with known mutations in light green, And in dark green, you can see the proportion without non-drug resistant mutations. So you can see that for fluoroquinolones, 37% of the isolates didn't have a known mutation. And for second line injectables, 19. This is very different to South Africa. 64 of the 472 had ether resistant. And most of them had ether resistance to one drug, although there were six isolates that had resistance to more than uh, one drug. Among the 76 events with ether resistance, 56, if we saw rare and mi micro ether resistant, had 10% or less of resistant bacterial population. And these are the isolates that they may not be diagnosed with current molecular met methods as, as resistant strains. So here is the frequency of the resistance based on the anti-tuberculosis drug and based on the susceptibility. So as you can see, 3.1% uh, of the susceptible and 3.6% of the resistant had the resistant isolates, very similar. But what was very interesting is that 9.5% of the isolates had heteroresistance based on fluoroquinolone drug resistant associated loci. So here are the 44 isolates with the resistance. If we sum the rare and the micro, 4.5% of the isolates had less than 10% of the bacterial population with the mutant allele. The affected loci reflects the most frequent mutations associated with fluoroquinolone resistance. And what was very interesting is that one third of the heteroresistant isolate 
had mutations, had multiple mutations associated with fluoroquinolones, and 27% had multiple loci affected. <clears throat> Here is the tail resistant in MDR tuberculosis. Most of them, 91%, didn't have a tail resistance, but 21, which corresponds to 9%, had a tail resistance. And very interesting, 7% of the total, 233, had a tail resistance to fluoroquinolone and second line injectable. So, so far, we can say that standard molecular tests are inadequate to rapidly identify pre-XDR and XDR TB in the Philippines. The molecular-based DST may miss a small but significant proportion of fluoroquinolone resistance. 4.5% had rare or micro resistance, and therefore, and half of them were susceptible, and therefore this could have been missed by current molecular methods. And interestingly, 7% of the MDR isolates had a tail resistance to fluoroquinolones and second-line injectables, suggesting that these strains are in the process to become pre-XDR and XDR. So we are in the process to complete the ethyl resistance analysis and link this data to clinical outcomes to understand the impact of this phenomena, to complete the whole genome sequence to identify novel mutations in those strains that didn't have known drug resistant associated mutations, and to start the pilot to uh, evaluate the feasibility of routine targeted next generation sequence at the National Reference Lab. So this work is the product for, uh, from a multi-institutional team for um, the Philippines, the first four, and four institutions in the Philippines, the University of the Philippines Manila, the Department of Public Health, the Research Institute of Tropical Medicine, and the Lone Center uh, of the Philippines. And in the United States, UCSF, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, TGEN, and the University of Tennessee. On the left side, you can see, um, on the right side, you can see the photo of the clinical team and next to the, the laboratory uh, team. Thank you very much. <laughs> so questions, please, maybe two. Hi, thank you. It's a very interesting presentation and a very important topic. My question is, wouldn't it be better to use sputum sample to look for heteroresistance at this point? Because you can have a bias by the culturing of the isolates, so it doesn't reflect what is the situation in the patient. Completely agree. So we, are, um, we started with culture because that's the sample that we have, but currently we are doing a study comparing the culture and direct sputum. Uh, small technology has shown that it is possible to identify heteroresistance in the sample, but probably the analytical sensitivity would be lower. But uh, we are in the process to, uh, of testing that. But yes, you are right. Uh, it, we want to do it in the, the sputum sample to avoid any bottleneck because of the culture method. Hello, Stefan Niemann from Germany. Uh, I would like to ask you, how can you distinguish contamination from real mixed populations? When you say is contamination like laboratory contamination? It is like very likely that there is a lot of DNA around in the lab or in the processing in the diagnostic lab. Any kind of contamination is kind of realistic and you, how do you do that? So to, to get a real answer, what is in the sample? So we haven't evaluated that possibility. I think uh, um, it's something that we should consider, but we haven't uh, evaluated that possibility. I think that um, it's true that if we are being so sensitive, we could identify um, not just the technical errors at the level of the sequencing, but I can see uh, your concern about the contamination. And we will evaluate it. I think that it, it's, it's worthy. Thank you for mentioning. So I guess we'll move on to the next speaker. Yes, I would like thank to you. invite, thank you. We'd like to invite Dr. Welel Sikonze, 
a clinical epidemiologist currently working at the Iswatini National TB Program, and she will talk about her experience with the national surveys on TB prevalence and uh, DR TB resistance. Thank you for the invitation to present, and thank you to the organizers for this tool. So I'll be sharing with you the results of our second anti-TB drug resistance survey on behalf of the team that, that has been supporting us over the years from the inception and to currently the analysis and the programmatic implications following the results of the TB drug resistance survey. So for those who are unfamiliar with Swaziland, now known as Eswatini, it's a small country in sub-Saharan Africa, high TB, HIV, and DRTB burden country, completely surrounded by South Africa and Mozambique, which poses a challenge for cross-border um, TB control, uh, surveillance, and transmission issues, of which despite these challenges, the country has made significant progress with case detection, as well as treatment success, however, case fatality still remains a major challenge, particularly amongst our DRTB patients. So over the years, particularly over the last decade, we've seen a really rapid decline in our case notification rates from 11,000 in 2010, 2009, to currently 3,000, uh, just under 3,000 as of last year. And this is mainly due to the fact that the TB epidemic is largely driven by the HIV uh, co-epidemic in the country, and we're also seeing an emerging uh, NCD epidemic that is also contributing to this. We see a similar trend amongst our DRTB case notifications as well. So just to give you some background information, we first conducted, or we conducted our first TB drug resistance survey in 2009, or the country did this, together with support from our partners at the time. And from the 2009 survey, we were made aware of this mutation, I491F mutation, which accounts for what we thought at the time was 30% of our cases with rifampicin resistance that is not detected by the molecular methods that were available to us at the time, as it is outside of the RPOB hotspots region. And this was published in the 2015 uh, NEJM paper, which can be publicly accessed. So when planning for the repeat or the second drug resistance survey, we ensure to include a component of whole genome sequencing based on this knowledge, on this history, particularly to characterize the strains collected through the survey and investigate the frequency of mutations associated with resistance to the first and second line anti-TB drugs in new and previously treated cases. It was 100% national sampling to ensure adequate representation, and we utilized the national diagnostic algorithm, which is currently in practice from 2015, ensuring experts testing for all presumptive TB cases, and uh, first-line LPA culture, first-line DST for those that are Frampton susceptible, and if RR by experts, we then add on second-line LPA, second-line DST, or if those results of RR become available at a later stage. And this has been in practice since 2015 for the last four years. So by the time we implemented the survey, it had been embedded within the routine setting for the last two years. We also, for the whole genome sequencing component, through the support of WHO, we partnered with the SRL in Milan, in which we shipped our culture isolates from the culture positive MTB complex patients for sequencing using the Illumina NextSec uh, 500 and MTB-SEC was utilized for the analysis and reporting of MTB lineage, RIF, INH, PZA, fluoroquinolone, and second-line injectable uh, mutation frequency, as well as some analysis, ongoing work on the transmission uh, dynamics. So of the 1,400 patients that were enrolled into the study, these are all expert MTB-positive cases. Uh, we had 1,100 or so culture MTB complex positive cases, and of these, 1,000 isolates were then shipped for uh, sequencing, and 734 of these were successfully sequenced. So we have a representation of just about 73, 74%. When looking at the uh, prevalence estimates, we had RRTB prevalence estimates based on experts, based on LPA, based on midgets, and based on sequencing. 
Uh, following a review of these together with our technical support team, a decision was made to base uh, the revision of these estimates on whole genome sequencing and maintaining WGS as our gold standard. As you can see, the prevalence, of, uh, prevalence estimates amongst new cases has remained stable over the last 10 years from 2009 and the 2019 updates doesn't see much of a change. However, we do see a really uh, a reduction, a 50% reduction amongst our previously treated cases or previously treated patients from 34% to 17%. And there are a number of programmatic as well as health system strengthening factors that have contributed to this. Over the last 10 years, we've been focusing on PMDT and laboratory strengthening initiatives. When we looked at the case classification for RRTB uh, prevalence estimates, maintaining our gold standard as whole genome sequencing compared against our frontline diagnostic tests for TB and uh, rifampicin resistance, we see that only 42% of the patients that are RR by uh, whole genome sequencing are also RR by um, gene experts. So there's, there's, therefore, 58% of our true RRTB cases are incorrectly classified or diagnosed as rifampicin susceptible by experts. This was not um, really shocking for us as we were aware of this issue from the previous survey. However, the magnitude of it was what really took us by surprise and required us to really spur into action a plan, an action plan uh, for the programmatic implications over the last four months that we've been working with on this with our technical support team. We then looked at the INH resistance profile amongst these cases with the RPOB 491F mutation or I491F mutation. And unsurprisingly, we see a high uh, correlation in terms of INH resistance amongst these cases of 94%. But what was also really um, a concern for us and what we needed to focus on in this redesigning our treatment algorithm was 40% who would truly be INH monoresistant cases, uh, but not diagnosed as true monoresistance at the time of baseline diagnosis and would require a modified treatment regimen. And this was just after uh, the revision of the INH monoresistance uh, treatment guidelines. So in reviewing the diagnostic algorithm, most of the work had already been done in terms of having the background a molecular diagnostic algorithm that is required and recommended by WHO in terms of implementation of these uh, molecular tests that has already been in the, in the works for the last four years and we needed to enhance this to ensure we could capture as much of this mutation that we were missing with the test that we were currently using, hence the introdu introduction of LJ. But also really importantly for us were these RS, INH, R cases whom at the time we considered treating as MDR. However, we are aware of almost 40% of these cases being true INH mono cases and would not be uh, eth ethically sound to treat as MDR TB cases. However, at the time we would not be aware of their, um, of their resistance profile with this mutation in the background. And a recommendation which we are following through was to really look at the implementation of targeted uh, sequencing at the baseline level, particularly for these RS, INH, R cases to rule out those who uh, would not benefit from a full MDR TB regimen. So through the sequencing work that has been conducted in collaboration with our partners in uh, the SRL Milan with the WHO as well, we've done a cluster analysis to look at uh, the transmission profile of our cases. And we can really see from this uh, from this analysis, a high clustering rate of almost 40%. And we can also see really two, two main clusters, uh, one of which is MDR and, one, and the other one isn't. And, when we, and this is of all the 730 odd strains that were uh, sequenced and not just of the MDR, TB or of the RR strains that were sequenced. When we focus mainly on those on the strains that contained the, or that harbor the RPOB I491F mutation, we see a really high clustering of, this, uh, of these strains uh, in a certain, within the cluster analysis. And this work is still on, ongoing to understand the transmission analysis, where these patients are, who they are, the epidemiological review of these cases, as well as the ongoing surveillance of these hotspots where these cases are coming from. 
So in conclusion, after much consultation, much discussion, and uh, much review of the survey findings as well as the programmatic implications, expert MTB RIF remains an accurate test for the diagnosis of TB in Eswatini, formerly known as Swazan. However, it cannot be relied on for the accurate diagnosis or detection of rifampicin resistance. And this applies as well for the other WHO, uh, WRD tests, LPA, midgets, and other tests that have been utilized within the, our algorithm over time. So in revising our laboratory algorithm, we really needed to include uh, the implementation of solid media, particularly LJ, but also for a country that had already reached 100% universal DST, uh, the next step was to adopt targeted sequencing for the, specifically for the RS, INHR cases. And this is work in progress that we are working on together with our SRLs, uh, with our, our technical partners as well, and in-country partners. Also, this was work that we are looking at collaborating with the HIV program for sequencing of their HIV DR patients. As I showed earlier, we have a high co-infection rate, particularly amongst our pre-XDR and XDR TB cases. When it comes to revision of our PMDT guidelines, the INH decision was taken to um, adopt a conservative approach when it comes to the treatment of our INH mono cases. However, we could not use the, uh, the INH, uh, the RSZE plus LIVO regimen in our setting due to the uncertainty of rifampicin resistance at the time of baseline diagnosis. So these cases are currently being treated uh, with RZE, RZE and closely being monitored. Uh, just anecdotal and also review of case of clinical records, we are aware of a certain level of overtreatment within the routine where patients with INH mono are routinely treated with MDR with, favor with more favorable outcomes. And the uh, outcomes analysis of these patients is currently ongoing and will hopefully be shared in the next uh, conference. And then, excitedly, this, this is a real opportunity for the country to evaluate the model of pathogen-based precision medicine for DRTB, and we are looking at engaging and also partnering with some of our partners for this initiative. Further and beyond Swaziland, within the country, we do need to strengthen our genomic surveillance, particularly for a country that has implemented all the strategies that are required for case detection and appropriate treatment initiation and also to triangulate the sequencing data that has been made available within the country with our neighboring countries as we are fully aware of the cross-border uh, challenges that all three countries are facing, as well as other countries within the region, particularly within the sub-Saharan uh, region. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sikonze. We have time for one question. Thank you, um, Liz, Liz Corbett from London School. Um, can I just, just ask the, um, so, so how, how much do you think that uh, you'll be able to get on top of this problem with um, whole genome sequencing? Can you do it quickly enough? And have you considered any kind of change to the, to the regimen? Um, so introducing more of a you know, pan-sensitive regimen at an earlier stage? Thank you. So these are two really sticking points that have um, polarized a lot of the technical discussions. Um, with regards to whole genome sequencing, that is the end goal. Currently, what we can do feasibly with the support that has been made available to us is just targeted genome sequencing. And looking at the infrastructure needs, that is feasible within the next uh, six months in country. Uh, with regards to treating or being a bit more aggressive in our approach for treatment of these cases, it also, there's also an element of ethics involved in that discussion. Uh, even though we are aware that some of these patients are already being treated as MDR-TB cases, and re review of the routine data shows more favorable outcomes. Possibly, uh, within a year when we have sufficient data from the specific cohorts or these specific patients, 
uh, who were enrolled in 2017, so the outcomes analysis will be available by mid of 2020, will then be able to make a more informed decision on whether they should be treated as MDR cases, all of them right from the onset. So I, I, I was thinking more about your MIST and um, rifampicin resistant cases. So, so in your retreatment patients, just you're, you're missing one in 20 patients will be reported as rifampicin sensitive when in fact they're rifampicin resistant. Yeah. So, so are you thinking about changing your regimen to accommodate that issue? So. So I'm going to listen to a panel discussion on the near, f near future uh, uh, perspectives for the two non-sputum TPP. Uh, Claudia Deckinger is going to chair this panel and she will introduce the panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'll welcome Emmanuel again on the stage and with him uh, Nias Banai, the head of the Stanford Microbiology Laboratory who has with a lot of rigor and quality laboratory um, systems evaluated many novel diagnostics. Also I welcome Akos Shomaskofi who has been recently um, at uh, Intellectual Ventures Global Good, now is joining uh, Roche uh, Molecular Diagnostics. And last but not least, Adrian Shapiro here, <laughs> who is uh, joining us from University of Washington, um, MD, PhD by training with a focus on HIV prevention and TB diagnostics, who has been very much involved with uh, BMGF effort on LAM diagnostics. So I'll leave this. So thank you to all of you for coming. So you have all heard a lot of presentations this morning. And I first want to actually take the opportunity to get an assessment from you all um, on, with all of the innovative science that we have seen this morning, what do you think is the likelihood that in about five years time we'll have a diagnostic on the market that meets the triage or diagnostic TPP? If we can just do the, maybe ladies first. Adrian, do you want to start? <laughs> Thank you so much. So I, I have to say, clarifying from the program, I'm not Karen Heikman, I'm not from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. However, I am a grantee and part of a consortium that Karen um, leads looking at LAM diagnostics for TB. So with that perspective, um, I would say, based on what we've seen this morning and based on the landscape or landscape that, that we have, um, I do think we are, I'm optimistic that in five years, but probably not a whole lot before then, uh, we would have a, a diagnostic that meets the WHO TPP criteria. And I'm most excited about LAM as a, as a diagnostic tool, and I think there really are a lot of um, exciting components, many of which uh, were mentioned this morning, um, about ways to advance us to a commercial on the market or at the, right at the tip of the market um, to really make an impact. Thank you. Yeah. So I won't repeat again for LAM, you know <laughs> my point now. And uh, the thing is that if we want, I mean, a, a test that would meet the TPPs by in, in the next five years, we need a technology which is basically already there. And uh, this is possible mostly for, I mean, uh, LAM because it's an antigen based on the lateral flow test. That could be also the same for another marker that we haven't discovered yet, though the transformation from discovery to I mean, full developed product is quite lengthy. Uh, otherwise, if we speak about molecular testing, there will always be the hurdle of accessing them at the point of care to really meet the TPPs, not from the technical standpoint, but for, I mean, access standpoint. So I really think that we would get into, in, in the next five years, to the one or multiple tests reaching the TPPs, and they would be more likely, uh, I mean, antigen-based, could be as well molecular, but they, re they really need the, the, now, the, I mean, the, the appearance of a transformative platform in the, in the RNA-DNA space. Um, so I'm kind of excited about the cell-free DNA uh, pathogen detection 
I think the um, challenge is in the solving the pre-analytics processing. It, once that happens, I think there is great prospect for having a sensitive and already specific test. And do you think in five years' time? I'm sorry? Do you think in five years' time? <laughs> um, yeah, I actually do. Um, it could be um, much shorter than that. Wow, OK. So, so when I asked Sharon the question earlier, sorry to now <laughs> poke a bit deeper on that, uh, whether this could uh, be done on an already existing platform, Emmanuel was just mentioning the lengthy timeline and essentially that the platform has to be there already. Akos, I know that uh, you at Global Good were able to play a lot with different platforms. Maybe between Nias and you, you can comment on what do you think then the platform is going to be for a cell-free DNA test if you really think this is going to be reality in five years' time? So, um, again, I think the challenge to cell-free DNA testing is not in the detection system, it's in the processing mm -hmm. of the sample. And, um, existing commercial assays such as expert could easily handle it once we pass the hurdle of processing. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> first coming back to the point of TB Lamb, uh, yes, we have still quite a few analytical questions to be solved, especially for HIV negatives, which is the tricky part, and but of course that has the major influence on the epidemic of the disease. But in addition to that, I think for the next five years, we should also keep in mind if we should wait five years for the best possible test, completely trying to fulfill each and every aspect of the TPP, or we should compromise on that road and uh, start to use existing technologies, and not just a single one that can address both HIV positives and HIV negatives, on that road because we desperately need a point of care test. Uh, we have to keep in mind that, you know, the present turnaround times in the field with expert are extremely long. It's, it's measured not in days, but weeks. And when we report back results in weeks with expert, and we know that in 24 hours we lose 20 to 30 percent of our patients for treatment I think we have to keep these basic things in mind when we try to compromise a little bit with potential, not super good, but potentially useful really point of care tests that can help us to go a little bit lower in the diagnostic network. And coming back to the point of the cell-free DNA, the question of course in some extent is the price. I believe that you referred to that, what COGS can be achieved. Uh, so right now, specifically for cell-free DNA, I don't see a specific platform that could uh, uh, you know, offer a different cost of goods what we have right now, let's say with Cephate or similar technologies. But again, as, as, as Nias pointed out, in addition to the platform, I think the, the, the major question will be what does it cost to, to concentrate to clean up the sample, you know, the pre-analytical step, because that has a major impact on the, mm -hmm. on the cost of goods. But again, we have to keep in mind if we have solutions, uh, non-sputum-based solutions, such as Jerry's approach with the swab, or cell-free DNA using urine and blood, and we are able to address hundreds of thousands of patients who are not able to provide sputum at all, that can also have a major impact on the COX, correct? Because the numbers of testing would or could significantly increase. Thank you for those elaborations. Nias, maybe you can elaborate a bit more on um, what are the crucial points in the pre-analytical part uh, for cell-free DNA, just so that we understand that better. Where do you think, what is going to break its neck if it's not going to be successful? Yes, so, um, you know, the, in, in the infectious diseases, we are lagging behind oncologists and obstetrics who have, over the past decade, nicely um, developed um, reagents for collecting blood and urine and also have optimized how to process these to a point where it meets their need for cancer mutation detection and prenatal diagnosis. 
in a way that we are just starting to do that for infectious diseases. And so um, we recently conducted a study to figure out how to optimize different steps. And we now know that the cheapest reagents, such as EDTA, EDTA, is good enough for blood and urine preservation. We have learned that just simple um, processing um, of samples with a single sep spin separation of plasma and no processing of urine, up to 24-hour delay, gives you accurate results, as good as it gets. Um, areas um, that need further improvement is that we also have learned that um, larger volume gives you the highest accurate sensitivity. So the question is, how do you extract efficiently and cheaply from a large volume of urine and um, whatever plasma that you can get to um, combine with a downstream detection method? So those are the hurdles that we need to get over next. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Akos, maybe you could comment like self-free DNA, blood versus urine. What do you think is most likely going to, to work? If you say it's volume, then should we all go after urine? I mean, <laughs> sure. Uh, OK, theoretically, uh, th the simple logic could be, you know, to, to, to use self-free DNA as a, as a biomarker that can cut cross diseases because of the nature of the biomarker, and then in addition to that, because of the nature of a uniform sample, correct? That if you could use blood or plasma and cell-free for several pathogens, you are already cutting across by two important means uh, uh, through disease silos. Um, Volume-wise, or, or, okay, coming back to your question, urine or, or plasma, well, there's a lot of questions to be uh, answered, uh, especially, again, coming back to HIV positivity and HIV negativity. What is the better specimen? Yeah, so we are finding that urine is actually an easier sample to work with. It's cleaner. It already, the kidney has already gotten rid of things that interfere with extraction. One thing that I forgot to point out is that urine is, um, cell-free DNA is actually degraded in urine sit in the bladder. So one other challenge is how do you get this urine from these patients before it's uh, the self-free DNA is degraded. So that's another sort of pre-analytical challenge that yeah. one has to solve. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Thank you. There was one question that reached us through the app uh, on self-free DNA that maybe one of you, you can ans answer. It's uh, can um, antibiotic susceptibility testing be done uh, from self-free DNA using, for example, Sherlock? <laughs> I would say let's first try to diagnose TB <laughs> <laughs> before going for susceptibility yeah. testing. However, let me say that um, engineers at Stanford are already pulling out fragments of DNA from plasma um, using probes and combined with microfluidic. So it's plausible that you can pull out resistance targets. Yeah, good. Thank you. And if we can't, because there's a chance to that since, again, these are small fragments. Uh, so it's a very interesting and good question. One should keep in mind that potentially, similarly to, to TB lamb, we could just simply use cell-free to monitor treatment efficacy, you know, by a quantitative assay if mm -hmm. the presence or absence is changing during mm -hmm. the course of the treatment. That's a monitoring assay more so than a DST. Okay. Coming back to LAM, Adrian. Maybe um, you could let us know a little bit about the efforts from BMGF uh, and where do they stand aiming for the best of the best? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Nothing as you less. say, the approach that the BMGF is taking is to try to get the best of the best of each of the components going into a LAM assay. So a pre-concentration stage, uh, optimizing antibodies for capture and then both, <clears throat> excuse me, antibody optimization for detection and signal amplification or readout. Um, at a recent convening of different partners working on all of these different components, I would say there's, there's been substantial progress on, on approaching each of these components. So several of the partners have um, improved the concentration, the pre-test concentration to try to concentrate lamb out of large, larger volumes of urine. And I think there's, it's, it's really getting quite close to um, 
taking the sensitivity of the assay to that next level of being able to detect even very low concentrations of LAM in HIV negatives, as well as HIV infected, highly immunosuppressed uh, patients. So I think there's, and I'll put in a, a plug for a poster that is discussing one of the um, concentration efforts of, um, that is being supported by the Gates Foundation, the, the SALIS test, which concentrates up to five mils of urine as opposed to sort of the 60 microliters that's used for some of the other assays. Um, so that's the pre-concentration stuff with the antibodies. There, the Gates Foundation is investing a lot of work in developing new antibodies and combinations of antibodies. So that was something briefly touched on this morning that um, while there are excellent antibody combinations currently available, it is possible, um, so uh, Dr. Leota's group has shown that it is possible that um, even with the current combinations, we're going to miss some epitopes of LAM, uh, either in a setting-based fashion or in a um, possibly a co-infection-based fashion. And so being able to figure out not just which combinations for detection capture, but which combinations across multiple epitopes at once may need to come in place. And so both the structural work to try to find new antibodies as well as um, some plans to uh, use to source LAM from large volumes of urine and some of the partners that you mentioned who are going to be developing new or higher affinity antibodies. I think also there's been a lot of progress, um, but there still may be at, at least incremental progress that can be made in that realm. Uh, and then the third component is the readout. And so this is obviously something that the, the Fujilam has really um, cornered the market in with a, a very powerful signal amplification technology. But there are a few other um, partners within the foundation's consortium in the works devel also developing signal amplification technology so that even a slightly detected, very low concentration of LAM produces a very clear readout signal. And so uh, Melogic has a particle um, uh, detection signal that they are going to be getting into um, some validation studies quite soon. And I think uh, Gates is very excited about putting all of these components together into a single assay, that finding the best of the best and getting collaborators to, to work together. Thank you for this nice overview. We have seen with expert and other molecular tests, the more sensitive we get, the more specificity is an issue. And Emmanuel had highlighted it that while it's more specific than the polyclonal antibodies were from earlier, it still has its issues. The Fuchilam right now, will we see the same issue with uh, the novel tests? Or are they going to be really targeting the complex only and not only, not all slow growing bacteria? So the antibodies, that I'm aware of that are being targeted either for development or for further optimization will be for MTB specific uh, LAM epitopes. Mm -hmm. So the goal is to really advance the sensitivity without losing specificity. Yeah. But I think, you know, Akosh makes an excellent point that being completely wedded to very specific numbers in the TPP may hinder the overall effort of getting getting a test out that is very, very good, but not at the desired levels. So I think that there's, for each of those components, there's probably some wiggle room um, about what's going to be prioritized. I think right now sensitivity is, is kind of a goal for, for prioritizing mm -hmm. to be able to detect across HIV positive and negative specifically. Um, but there may come a little hit in specificity. Uh, remains to be seen. Yeah. I'll, I'll pick up a question from the app, actually, in that respect. It was asked, um, what is the sensitivity of the Fuji LAM is an HIV negative? And maybe, Emmanuel, you can comment on that. And why are we not rolling it out for HIV negative right away, even if it's suboptimal, which speaks to Akos's, yours, and Adrian's comments? So maybe you could comment once we know the, the number, maybe, from Emmanuel. <laughs> All right. So. Um Currently, there are, we have limited set, sets of da data on HIV neg, but we um, in evaluate the sensitivity of Fujilam in HIV negative population around in between 40 and 60 percent. It's still low number of patients enrolled, so that's why I mean it hasn't been, been put out uh, to the public uh, yet. The other question, and I totally agree with, I mean, should we be I mean 
adamant with the constraints of the TPPs in terms of performance, or can, can we lose up a little bit there? Uh, for uh, for Fujilam specifically, I mean, as of now, the WHO recommendation for Alir uh, test was an, uh, focused on HIV positive only. So the basic idea behind doing the clinical testing mostly for HIV positive people was to show the incremental I mean, value of the Fuji lamb versus the Alia lamb to show, I mean, as Stephanie has displayed, the, I mean, the, the, the progress made in terms of sensitivity and not maybe to blur the message with, oh, it's a very good test in HIV positive, but it's not that good in HIV negative. So is it worth it to uh, roll out and to uh, expose? That's really, really the strategy there. Of course, f I mean, I can't talk I mean, I'm not in Fujifilm's shoes, but as an assay developer, as, an, as, as a manufacturer, you need to firmly establish your test with a very good performance first, then extend to other indications. I mean, HIV neg, extrapulmonary TB, I mean, potentially also uh, meningitis by detecting lamb in urine. So that's, I think it's all in the plan. It's just that it has to be step by step. Otherwise, you dilute. The, I mean, the information and you dilute the value of a marker if it's too broad at the, I mean, uh, really at the very beginning. Thank you for that assessment. Um, I would like to open it up uh, to the audience for questions and then maybe come back with a few. Um, I see one already back there. Jerry? Yeah, hi. <laughs> um, so I have a question about uh, just the underlying, <clears throat> the underlying value that that point of care is maybe an essential requirement for um, for <clears throat> triage testing. If you think of how triage might work in a setting like a workplace or a school or a prison or something like that, um, you know, it, point of care. I understand the advantages of it, but if we if it means sacrificing sensitivity or ease of sample collection, then um, you know. I'm just wondering, you know, what, what the panelists might think of that. Who wants to take the question? <laughs> you have the bank. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. I think it's an excellent point about institutional settings, prisons or b workplaces in an institution, ideally, but uh, where you have congregate settings where people are going to be returning. I think the advantage of a point of care test that I really would advocate is, is a goal, um, is to be able to find people in settings where there's a much lower likelihood of return, that you get the answer right then and you can make a decision about treatment immediately. I think in, you have the luxury, relatively, in a, in a workplace, prison, school setting of, of people coming back. You'll see them again the next day. But we know that people are lost to follow up, lost to care in that initial waiting period for a test result. And if you can have that at point of care in a village, if you can have that at point of care even at a street clinician uh, uh, storefront, that would be much better in terms of retaining. So I, I do think the point of care is, is uh, an admirable and, and useful goal that we should stick to. Not to say that having non-point of care options like Gene Expert is now in, in many settings, is still, that's still going to be a, a very useful contribution. But I think we do need point of care. So similar to like what you mentioned earlier, not sticking exactly to sensitivity, specificity, maybe also giving some leeway for settings where the requirements might not be that strict in terms of operational characteristics. Yeah, thank you. There was a question from my co-chair. So, uh, <laughs> You know, just bringing you to, uh, you know, an endemic setting where there is, as they say, huge uh, loads of latent TB, a good load of incipient or subclinical TB, and of course, active TB. So when we talk of any of the tests that we're talking of, or in fact, uh, expert ultra as well, it may just be detecting DNA, maybe latent DNA, maybe dead DNA, maybe old treated DNA. And if you're going to treat such patients for active TB. So where do we draw the line? Are any, so like Dr. Niaz said, the, you know, the people who are working with cancers are way ahead of us. We are just struggling to have a test in place. And do we, um, uh, you know, think of, you know, drawing the line or um, having the limit of detection 
tell us whether this patient has latent TB or subclinical TB or clinical TB because the treatment regimens would differ even in the West. You would like to treat latent TB. We would like to treat here, but then with the, um, with the burden of tuberculosis, active TB, there'll be reinfection. And, uh, you know, so we are moving towards that, but we fail to have a test which actually tells us clearly. So what I'm talking about is limit of detection. Are we looking at that at all? <laughs> Do you want to answer this? So looking into, I think, when, if I could understand it correctly, subclinical TB, latent TB, getting in that direction with the detection methods that we have. And maybe I'll make a plug while you think. Um, there is going to be a symposium on subclinical TB on uh, Thursday morning, um, organized by Ismail Hanif. So please come for that. <laughs> Right, so as we already discussed in the question of sensitivity for the, I mean, any, I mean, an antigen detection or, I mean, a molecular-based uh, technique is really key. And we, we see already that getting that uh, kind of response in active TB patients is already very hard. But I think more for maybe latent TB, one avenue is really more the study of the host markers. Because, I mean, uh, in, the, in, that, in that area, we may be able to pick up variation or at least longitudinal data from patients to see whether these markers have an increase or a decrease according to a pattern, pre-established pattern uh, for I mean, uh, moving from latent to active TB. Mm -hmm. So maybe, and we didn't speak a lot about host markers today. This is a very interesting field because, I mean, as, as we've already discussed as well, it's been studied quite extensively for cancer, for other disease. And I think TB could benefic benefit from this research done on host markers. Because host markers, we see also the, the difficulty in terms of specificity for a diagnostic or a triage, but could be a very good, I mean, a very good way to explore the latent TB uh, in, if we really want to have this longitudinal and uh, picking up cases at the very source. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions? I see one more right yeah. there. Uh, you mentioned the sensitivity of the uh, Fuji Lamas uh, 40 to 60. That makes me think of microscopy, which in some settings is similar. Do we know what, whether there's, you're detecting the AFB positive, uh, the, the, uh, the, the acid phosphacylide positive patients with the Fuji Lam, or are they additive? So uh, could we think of a combining Fuji Lam and microscopy and detect increase the proportion of these patients detected? In HIV negative. Yeah. 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 So I mean the, in, in terms of in terms of performance, the Fuji Lam test is in the same ballpark for uh, sensitivity as compared to the to to the um, to the microscopy. And the other end I mean in terms of I would say ease of use, it's less um, patient dependent, so it's really, it's really. I mean, uh, I would say, in optimal in that term is that it's less user dependent, and also specificity is quite high, as well. As for the, I mean, the, the additional value of Fujilam in uh, with, uh, I mean, uh, smear microscopy, in uh, I don't have the data. On I mean, uh, right now, on, on top of my head, and I'm not sure they're available, but it's something that needs to be I mean, uh, studied in, a, I would say, more operational research orientation, because as of now, most of the st studies done on Fujilam was retrospective or prospective, but based only on diagnostic accuracy versus the reference standard, and when we roll out the plan of I mean, the actual clinical testing in the field, with, and the, I mean, the, at the end user, with the end user, with I mean, the, the end population, we will be able to generate this kind of data. But I think it's an excellent question because, I mean, obviously in HIV positive, uh, we struggle getting often a sputum from the sample. In HIV negative, that's not so often the case. Uh, so maybe that's an analysis that needs to be done to look at the added value of a smear microscopy or other sputum-based tests. Yeah. Maybe I'll intersperse with, a, with a, another question. So we've heard a lot of, I think, exciting news this morning, uh, but I wanted to hear from all of you, like if there was something that we missed. Is there something that excites you that should have been here at TV Science today and we just didn't think of it? 
<laughs> Nothing, yes. <laughs> so, uh, I like to use every opportunities uh, <laughs> to mention that, that maybe it's just my perception, but uh, we are very much focusing on case detection and we focus probably not enough on patient follow-up and guidance of treatment and how we may use any of these technologies or if we cannot use them, what other means we have to mind about to emphasize that field. I mean, let's keep in mind that in reality right now the fundament of treatment follow-up in the field is smear microscopy. Those patients who would not turn into AFB positive would not be followed up by second line LPA, phenotypic DST and all that stuff. Uh, maybe I'm a little oversimplifying the matter, but I think we have to emphasize that field. Mm -hmm. And something in that field that we should know about that wasn't mentioned today, it was mentioned like sputum, lam, the, the RNA signatures as possible tools uh, for, for monitoring. Um, I think that was it. Um, <laughs> no? I think um, you covered most of the things that um, are relatively far along. Yeah. Um, there is earlier stuff that I'm aware of, but I don't think it's worth mentioning them until. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Too early, they'll come next, yeah. <laughs> All right, so maybe f to, to, to see some things that we may have missed, we may just take a few steps back and say, okay, if we don't think of in antigen-based assays, if we don't think of molecular testing, what's coming? And I think that the importance of the IT and digitalization is something that will make a huge difference in the next, I mean, I would have said 10 years, but we know how, it, how fast it can progress, so I would say in the next five years. And we see already that with them in the chest X-ray CAD program in which the, the use of I, AI and connectivity really helps the field with kind of old technology, but very old technology. So I think that we should benefit from the, all the progress that is made in the IT field because it's something that goes fast and as opposed to medical devices, don't, doesn't need I mean, thorough validation and all the manufacturing and all, I mean, everything we've been talking about, about getting access at the point of care, et cetera, it's already there. It's in the smartphones, it's, mm -hmm. it's in, the, in the cloud. And that's something that we, we should really use for the, in the diagnostic field and to step a little bit away from our history of what we've been developing for 20, 30, 40 years, but really look at what this, when, what added value all this technology can bring outside the classical uh, diagnostic box. So there were the cough apps very much in, in uh, favor a couple of years ago, but I know that they kind of faded away as a, as a tool on a smartphone to detect a cough pattern and essentially send a message to the owner of the smartphone, you have been coughing for a few weeks, you should be, you should be going see a doctor because maybe you have TB. Why, why is that not progressing? And is that down the line what you're thinking, Emmanuel? And I don't know, Adrian, how much you're aware of the Gates Foundation's efforts on, on that respect? Well, I know that there is an active line of research still on, on AI cough app processing. Um, Peter Small is involved in one initiative. He's mm -hmm. now at, at um, Ivy Global Good, but he's, he's very interested in using databases of off uh, audio recordings and large scale. So I don't, I don't know how far that's gotten and how mm -hmm. close to anything testable that's going to get. But I think the concept of um, using AI to aggregate data, that the massive amount of data that we do end up collecting uh, to see where we can uh, make progress either with chest x-ray. Although I, my, my reluctance with chest x-ray, and I think I'll make some enemies with this, is that still we're talking about a large piece of equipment that is going to re be residing primarily in a facility, maybe a giant mobile van. So I think it's got a role, um, but I, th I think um, in terms of really getting out into the, the far reaches, moving away from um, large equipment and keeping towards point of care is going to be most effective. But again, I, I think really nothing out because there are holes. And I guess one other hole would be thinking about 
what tests do we currently have that are not perfect but are available and ready to go? And I think you mentioned it a few times in passing uh, in your talk this morning, but CRP is an exclusion tool to rule out TB. It's, not, it's never going to diagnose TB, but a wider, wider adoption of point of care CRP to exclude TB could help uh, triage away some of those patients who don't need diagnosis. Yeah, thank you. A couple of final questions from the audience before we close and let you have lunch. Here, uh, sorry. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, I'm Nahid from UC San Francisco. Great session, thanks Claudia and Chez. Um, you know, in relation to this comment about diagnostics and the value it brings and the transition into treatment, I wondered whether um, you think we're conducting our diagnostic studies adequately to collect information on the burden of disease. Uh, it seems quite sensible for us. I think a lot of the emerging technologies are changing the game a bit, and we can start to not only tell you if you have TB, but tell you how much TB you have, and that affects your treatment. Uh, if we link the diagnosis and therapeutics decision-making together, in a more tightly kind of fashioned way, I think the sort of in use, usability of the diagnostics even go up, the value added goes up, and to Akash's point, it, it, it might make even patients come in sooner for care if they know that they get diagnosed early and they get treated with, uh, you know, shorter regimens. Thank you. It could go as a comment or like a question if you want to answer. Maybe a quick comment about this and other things we heard. I come from the, I mean, uh, from the industry of IVD, and IVD industry, medical device industry, is very conservative. And uh, I mean, this also maybe uh, uh, also addresses the point of why this cough app did not go further. It's because in the way that companies see that, the way that also governments, regulatory bodies see new applications that are basically not following the path of previous ones, I mean, really, they, they see that not intentionally because it's, to pro it's really to protect the patient, right? But it's very conservative in the approach. And here, given the burden of TB, given the urgency of the situation, we would benefit from loosening up a bit all these constraints that start with the TPP, of course, but also the way we perform the clinical studies, the way we get I mean, the, the data and find a balance between quality of the data and protection of the, I mean, the patients with I mean, accelerated access to new groundbreaking diagnostic that can make a difference. So that's really the challenge here as well to, to go from a nice concept in the lab to something in the field and trying to accelerate all these steps which are currently taking two, three, five years in terms of in the full uh, solution development. Thank you. And I think we'll end with a question from Ken Castro. Thanks. Uh, uh, Ken Castro, Emory University and USAID. I, I echo Payam's words. Uh, this has been an excellent session. What I'd like to invite you to do is uh, speculate about how do we start introducing the new technology into multiple assays? Because uh, at the end of the day, people show up with respiratory symptoms, and we're not only concerned about TB. We are also delinquent in properly diagnosing other etiologies of the pathophysiology, uh, and we should do better. So what do you have to say about uh, multiple assays? Yeah, excellent question. And I think, uh, Emmanuel, you were kind of alluding to it, if I heard uh, read in between the lines correctly, like decision-making tools that could be data, AI-driven potentially, might also be a critical uh, component in addressing that. And it's already used in, in uh, fever diagnostics more broadly, and I think we need to think much more about that in TB as well. Others have comments on that? Yes, there should be. Yeah, I think that's, that's a very, very good point, Ken. And, and if you just think about uh, uh, the pediatric uh, pneumonia arena where uh, of course, uh, uh, it's not only TB, uh, not only uh, what viral or bacterial pathogen, which would be extremely important to know, but in these uh, uh, high burden settings, uh, uh, in the absence of such technologies, 30% of these asthmatic children are diagnosed. 
as pneumonia and treated as such, uh, which I think it really underlines uh, uh, the lack and the gap of the additional diagnostics that are more comprehensive. This is why I try to say that maybe with cell-free, not necessarily for respiratory panel, but in general using the same biomarker, same type of specimen, we could better cut through certain diseases. Yeah, good. Thank you very much. Thank you to the panel uh, for this very good discussion. Thank you to all of you for attending and providing excellent input. Thank you to my co-chairs, Annette and Urvashi. And we'll have lunch now and be back at 1.30. Correct? Any other announcements to make? The poster? Poster and lunch is over there. <laughs> good.